everybody. It's episode 277 of PodQuest. Man, hey, I call it woo. totally yep. unprepared. I was expecting that. I was like, oh, Drew's not going to be ready. No, so, so was I, because he was looking at his phone the whole time. Yeah. Anyway, it's Wednesday, December 11th, 2019. I am Chris. With me is Walnut. Hey, guys. Druton. Hello. Now with a microphone in front of him. Yep. <laughs> How you guys doing? I'm, I'm all right. Still, I, it took me a few days to recover from PAX, but I'm all right. You were there for like a day total. I'm fat ankles that had surgery on them that's really all that it was was like my ankles were killing me well d- d- weren't, weren't, didn't you also like poop yourself to death nearly on like saturday uh, yeah nearly well no, it was you ate so, some gluten didn't you no it wasn't gluten it was i think it was um wawa breakfast a scrambled egg bowl ah full um, of gluten that like <laughs> i i scarfed that down because i was like on the train platform getting ready to come into philly as i was eating it and i didn't want to eat it while on the train itself I don't want to be that guy, so I scarfed it down. I think that's what messed up my stomach. Yeah. Um. But no, it it was so bad to a point that like I went and waited in a bathroom and in the expo hall until everybody left. No, no, no. I waited there for five to ten minutes, and there was all three stalls were filled. No one got out of that bathroom, so I had to go to a different bathroom, which two of those were filled, and I waited another five more minutes. Both guys got out at the same time. And me and another dude needed to go in there, and I the other dude was a much bigger guy than me, so I was going to let him use the handicap one, but I look inside the one that was a handicap, it's just covered in water. I'm like, dude, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've been waiting 20 minutes. He's like, I understand. Go do your thing. I'll find a different bathroom. It was bad. <laughs> and you know what you could have done? Gone outside the expo floor, where Down all the bathrooms hallway. were... V- Fairly empty yeah, and clean. I, well, the the one the one that it was outside in the hallway and out of the expo floor, the second one, and I could have just walked all the way down to that like nice area that with the car show they usually have like the really nice cars in. Yeah, and like right next to there, yeah, there's the bathrooms that no one was using. I went into one of those bathrooms r- earlier just to pee, and somebody blew it up so bad. Yeah, because <laughs> so, I mean that, that's where you go to poop. You go to the yeah. bathroom that no one's in. Exactly. Um, but yeah, PAX was PAX. It was a good time. Yeah, and that's where we're going to start this week with PAX Unplugged 2019. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Drew and I were there for basically the whole weekend. Drew yep. cut out a little early on Sunday. Sunday, and Richie took over for him. Yeah. Which worked out. Yep. Yeah. It was it was a good time. Especially I... since you, since you kind of like lost half a day anyway. Cause you, yeah. You got there a little late on Saturday yeah. to begin with. Yeah, I got there at a time I was okay with getting there at, but it was the leaving early because i wasn't feeling good I, that i was really bummed out on yeah so at least you you know you, you got to get back in there and make yeah. up a little time yeah i made up a little bit of it um but so what did you guys think about it this year so we, we've all been all three years in mm-hmm. some capacity it was an interesting layout this year like they didn't you they didn't really utilize the downstairs as much as they normally did they yeah. did there's just nothing down there for us the downstairs is where all of the RPG. role-playing stuff tends to be yeah, like it was also year, in a different part of the convention center. Yeah, it was. It was. Well, it was the same. It 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 was usually right where it was at the end of the expo hall. It was just they opened it up at the front, and I think there were other things going on in the convention center this weekend. No, nope. there weren't. I thought I thought I saw no, something. So it seems like the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia is a little more strict with security now. So all conventions seem to go in through the Broad Street entrance. Okay. Um. And they had certain parts of the downstairs just blocked off entirely. They didn't want you going down there. Yeah. So, like, every time we were leaving at night, rather than just going all the way down to the end and coming right out onto, I guess that's 11th Street? Yeah, 12th uh, yeah. or 11th. I can't think of which one it would be. Mm-hmm. Um, we were coming out, like, midway between the two streets and then walking down the next block just because of how they kind of had things blocked off downstairs. Okay. I mean, any time when, – when I left – both times and when i got there the, the first time it, it was like the first time i got there i had to go all the way to broad to pick up my badge yeah um but then any other time it was i just went in through jefferson and i left through jefferson oh through the upstairs through, through the, the upsta- hard rock yeah, through the, yeah yeah and i just went right right along the gallery which i'm so happy that is now open yeah and that, i don't have to go outside to get anywhere look, it's the fashion district <laughs> it's the get gallery. the name right what, what do you call the amphitheater that's in camden the the bb and t pavilion Fuck you. The Sony Entertainment no, Center. The Fuck you. Blockbuster <laughs> the Blockbuster Entertainment yes, Center. The Blockbuster Entertainment Center. It's the Tweeter Center. Or the All right, e you center? motherfuckers. The E Center, yeah. 
Susquehanna, yeah. I think it is Susquehanna Bank Center. Is Let's, it? Uh, is it Susquehanna Bank Center? No, it's no it, it was Tweeter Center, Susquehanna, then BB and T. Okay, yeah, it's the Tweeters. Like that's that's what I'm saying. It's the gallery, which I didn't know there was a, a level up in the gallery. There's also the third floor AMC is a dine in AMC. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's that's. I want to go there more often now. Yeah, no, and I mean, like honestly, like it's it's a mall. Like yeah, yeah. it's fucking. It's straight a mall. Mo- yeah. It is basically what it was before it closed. It is slightly nicer based on just cleanliness. Oh, sure. I did not feel gross walking through it, whereas when I were younger and it was, like, I, you felt just disgusting because it was, like, this gross beige color. Yeah, like, it, it was just, like, it was dingy. It was and it's old. been dingy since yeah. I was, like, five. Yeah. Because my fair. grandmother used to go over there, like, once a month. And, like, during the summer, every once in a while, like, I would go with her. Because there was, like, a KB toy and shit over there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But like, yeah, it was always just kind of dark and dingy, and yeah. now you know it's it's a three story mall that starts yeah. kind of underground, runs four blocks, I want to say something like that. Yeah, it's huge. It's, it's, it, it starts at eighth technically and runs to twelfth or roundabouts twelfth. Sure, because the Hard Rock's on twelfth, so it's like okay. between eleventh and twelfth. Yeah, so it, it's you know it's got a good good amount of space. And yeah, like it's got the arcade bowling level up yeah, place. Which, and I, I want to go. I want to go to that. I I've been wanting to do that at uh in Exton, but now that I know there's one that's down the street, and I can drink while I'm there because I just have to take the train home. It's even better. It was one of those opening in Deptford. Is that really? Yeah, where they took out the Sears and the Deptford Mall. Oh, uh, yeah, they've gutted that whole building. Yeah. Oh, nice. They gutted it and have put a new building up. Oh, nice. Uh, so the Dick's Sporting Goods is moving across the street, and it's going to be on, like, the bottom floor. And then Oh, of, I didn't realize that. Yeah, uh, one of those, the round one, is going to be on top with other stuff. Yeah. That's kind of cool. That's pretty sweet, then. Uh, or flip that one way or the other, I forget, but... It would make sense, Dick's on the bottom floor. Yeah, and... I'm pretty sure that's... But yeah, so so PAX, as you were saying. Um, they, Yeah, they, it's not that they, it was in a different spot, but it was just... It was skewed further down i guess yeah but they did they did lay it out i think a little bit better because it just it flowed better this year i feel yeah because i feel like last year there were just weird because if i remember correctly it went like the tournament area then the expo floor then the um free play stuff the, I ex- re- the expo I floor do not remember the expo floor has always been no yeah because no, last it's... so when we played Blo- blood on the clock tower last year it was in the far back corner. Yeah. Right. And p- Which, before that, you had the the library and all the free play tables. And mm-hmm. the, the actual expo hall with all of, like, the vendors and stuff was between that yeah. and the tournament on the other side. The year before, it was even different because they had main stage was also part of the expo show floor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because there was another thing happening in the convention center. Yeah, that was the uh, the year of the, the marathon, marathon, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I think this year... I liked I liked the layout this year because it was just kind of open tables for the different like the tournaments and for um, first play or whatever that section was called the mm-hmm. the new stuff that wasn't necessarily out yet yeah and then you kind of had the free play area for people getting stuff from the libraries or people that just bought new games and then the expo floor was like the rest yeah. of it. it 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 was a nice layout I will say I was very let down with the uh lacking major lacking of uh minis this year. Yeah, I was surprised by how like I don't go looking for those, but Erica was trying to find whatever fish person thing she yeah, was looking for. And I don't we saw one booth that actually had like a rack of boxed miniatures. Mm-hmm. But then, like none of cuz the last couple of years there've there've been those places that have like the big like roadie case sort of things. Yeah, like yeah. the the reaper the, minis. Oh, yeah. So I don't, I, I did not see any there, Reaper. There were no yeah. Reaper minis. There was just the one booth that had the D&D specific minis. Um, and then there was just... I think there were two booths that had um, uh, loose minis that were pre-painted. Yeah. And I'm like, that's cool and all, but I'd rather get my mini unpainted. And I mean, I'm not the painter at the moment. I would love to... I'm probably going to start just trying. Well, Yeah, I was going to say, just but, try. But, like, I, we have a painter in our group that she does really good painting work on her minis. And I would much rather have her, like, paint everybody's minis to their specification. Like, when we meet on Friday, she's going to ask everyone what they want their minis to look like, and she's going to paint them all. Yeah. Which, that's cool. Yeah. Um. But, but yeah, that was... 
I noticed that too. Yeah. I, f- I feel like there were there there were a lot. There were f- six woodworking places there. Oh uh, yeah, there were so yeah, many. I was going to say I, I feel like there were more th- there were more larger booths selling just expensive stuff versus like, essentially useful stuff or games being shown. Yeah, like I definitely didn't s- I mean, it was busier this year than it has been too very much but the last like the first two years especially like i was able to walk around and like there were interesting games set up that people were trying to get up like people to come sit down for yeah this year it seemed like there weren't as many just like come sit down booths like no there were a lot of those but there weren't as many interesting yeah, sort of not already fairly well established things from from what I was seeing, like that um that shopkeeper game that you played the one year. Yeah, they, didn't see that anywhere. They weren't even there. That that is now on my Amazon wish list because I couldn't find it this year. I yeah. was going to buy it if I found it this year. And, and like, there's that one table. Um, it, it's the Orphans and Ashes game, which I just know because it's such a ridiculous fucking title mm-hmm. that they were there the first two years and. Like, the first year, I think they just had one table with people playing, and, like, last year they had, like, two or three. This year they weren't there at all. Yeah. But, like, their tables were always full, so I just, I wonder if it was a, a an issue where those booths doing, like, the tables and the wood stuff were buying up too much space that, Wait, too, and- like, early on, like, like they were they were getting space early to the point where some of these smaller games just didn't have a chance to buy them. I, I feel like Or if they just true. weren't making money on the show, so they just didn't come. I, I mean, I don't think they weren't... There, there's probably... They probably weren't... It probably isn't they weren't making money on the show. It like um, eh, I, it, It's hard to know without knowing what... Yeah, because the there's cost. a couple things to keep in mind. Yeah. Read Pop is usually pretty expensive for tables. Mm-hmm. But generally, like, they have... They have a good reputation with a lot of shows, so, like, you're paying, you're usually paying a premium, but the people running the show take care of the vendors and people showing stuff, so, whereas, like, you go to some of these smaller shows, like, like, honestly, like, from what I hear, Wizard World does not treat people great. Yeah. So, like, you know, you pay a bunch for a Wizard World table and get treated like shit, you pay a bunch for a read pop run table, and, like, the people running those shows care about the shows and, like, take care of everybody. Yeah. Um, Philadelphia is also a union only building. I didn't realize that. You can't even unload your fucking car through the loading dock without somebody union there to do it for you. I didn't so, know that. I don't know if you saw, because I don't think it was got. Sent oh, the, to... the media email about yeah. filming. Yeah. Yeah. We even got an email on Saturday that if, um, like all media got it. Mm-hmm. If you were, um, filming, there were a whole bunch of rules and, if you were doing like specific types of filming, you had to pay to do it. Really? Yeah, like well, there was some sort of to, fee. Well, you had to get a union person to come do shit for you. Yeah, oh, I wow. actually I didn't catch that part of yeah, it. Yeah, that was that was the whole thing. Yeah, like I didn't look into it at all because we weren't filming anything like yeah. that. But yeah, it's basically if you were doing anything other than just a stationary camera on like a tripod, like beyond like cell phone videos and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Um, you had to like pay extra and get, apparently get like a union camera person in there. Wow. Yeah, it was. You couldn't even have a camera on a tripod and pan around the floor without having somebody union there. Like Philly kind of sucks for that stuff. Like it's good for for the union workers yeah. and all, well, Philly- but it sucks for people that have product that they have to bring in, do not have any sort of expensive booth to set up, that has to either park at a random parking lot and just carry the shit, or pay a crazy fee to actually unload it at the convention center. Yeah. Because those are those are the options that a lot of people have. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. yeah, any any vehicle that, from what I've heard from other people at shows like this, any vehicle that goes to the loading bay of the convention center, a union worker has to unload and deliver it to your spot. Mm-hmm. And any setup beyond like hanging banner, like a banner off of like the table, um, generally has to be done by a union like shop. Mm-hmm. So that shit gets expensive. Oh, definitely. And like, yeah, if if you're coming in with like a bunch of stands and like hundreds of copies of games to sell, you're probably not going to park at like a garage across the street and carry that shit over. Yeah. So that makes sense. So then, yeah, it could be money. Yeah, exactly. Whereas like some of these table companies, they're only bringing like you know a dozen, half a dozen demo tables with them. Yeah. Which is heavy, and like the cost to unload them is probably high. 
But if they sell five tables, they make up the cost. Yeah, they make up all of that cost because of how expensive those tables are. But it makes you think, like how how many of those tables do you think they're actually selling at this show? I am sure they actually sell way more than any of us think they do. Maybe. Like, I mean, I always go to the Geek and Sun booth. Like, they've been there all three years, and they have a raffle, and it's ten bucks to enter the raffle. I do that every year. Oh yes, I didn't know like, that. Like that's it. That's like I'll, I'll walk by um uh the the other uh what's the dice tray people um like the level up or whatever wood. the wormwood or the other dice tray people sure. that I can't remember like I'll Elder, walk or Elder Elder uh, Scroll or, or not Elder Scroll Elder Elderwood Academy like I'll work I'll walk by those and I'll look and I'm like this is this is nice but fucking hundred and twenty dollars for shit that like. Yeah. Like, and I understand the price. I understand. No, it. like yeah. I don't. I don't understand why anybody wants a ninety dollars set of dice. Uh, the dice, I don't understand. No, uh, it's yeah. the woodworking stuff. I understand. But even that, like some of it, like look, it is very high quality. It's I'm all not handmade. That. But at the same time, why would anybody want to pay a hundred and forty dollars for a little wooden disc that holds seven die? Uh, I tr- like I said, like yeah. But like that, that you're paying that money for the disc and the dice. Like dice are expensive. No, no, these are like the hundred and twenty dollar like hand carved things that don't have dice in them. They're just wooden boxes with um foam inside that like all seven dice from a set fit into one little like compartment. Some people just like spending money on shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess so. It's just it. Yeah, I don't know, man. Like er- Erica keeps buying like nice dice, but they're fifteen dollar sets. Yeah, like. I, it, I, you can order a set of dice from Critical Role right now. It's like $75. It comes in this nice, like, plush thing that holds it. One side you can use as a dice tray. The other side holds just the set of dice. And the dice look very nice, but it's freaking $75. Yeah. Basically for dice. Yeah, and, like, I understand, like, metal dice should be slightly more expensive because they're made of metal and all. But, like, these are, like, these precious gemstone die and everything yeah, like that for weird. $90. It's yeah. Like, why? Like I, I love dice. I'm never gonna. I'm hopefully never gonna spend that much money on dice. Yeah, like Erica bought a set for. I want to say it was the fifteen dollar set from that one booth that we were all waiting at for the um the raffle. Yeah, yeah, because I think you entered the raffle too. Yeah, I, I bought a set as well. Yeah, so yeah, that's right. You bought the the Hulk set. Yeah, that that it was the Gamma set because yeah. they, the copyright infringement. But the set that Erica got was um. The, the ends of them were clear, and then the middle portion of it was the color. Yeah. So depending on what angle you looked at it, sometimes the dice looked like it was all a color. Sometimes it didn't. Like, it, it was it was a very cool optical illusion, basically. Yeah. And, like, that's totally worth $15 if, like, it's a thing that you're going to use. Yeah. But, like, I don't know. That's, I, like, the limit of yeah. what I would ever spend on a dice set. Yeah, exactly. Like, anything more than, like, $15, and it's, like, dude, it's it's dice. Yeah. That's all. It's dice. Oh yeah, I. There totally... are lots of places that you can buy like bo- like what Sarah spent twenty five dollars on a box of dice, right? Uh, or yeah, tw- yeah. Or did she do the cheaper? She did the cheaper. Well, no, she did do the twenty five because she got the medium size thing. Okay. Yeah. And still, that was a box full of dice. Yeah, th- that was a like larger size Chinese food container full of dice. Yeah. Yeah. It, like at at Top Deck, you can go because they still have them up. You can go buy the pre-packaged like cups with dice in them for Christmas for people for twenty five bucks. Yeah, which uh, like, they had those at at um yeah packs too. Yeah, and it's like you might get you might only get technically one or two sets based on how the dice rolled to get into the cup, but you still have a bunch of dice. Yeah, but I I do feel like that like while I liked the layout of the expo floor. It was a little more catering towards just big vendors selling like du- dice sets and uh-huh. tables and woodwork stuff. Yeah. Instead of but, board games. Yeah, like I, I, I agree. Like I felt like there was a major lacking in the there, game department of this board game convention. There, there weren't even a lot of um of the, like straight D and D book places I, compared I, to. Yeah. There, there were like three of them, but like previous years there. have been more there were a lot of people i only s- really remember the one uh, yeah I only <laughs> seen so there were one. three places selling books that we saw one of them was actually on the far side pre the tournament section so when you oh, first come okay. in from broad street there were like three booths side by side up there one of them had a rack with they had a rack with minis and on the other side of the rack were D books you know i didn't actually look over there like i didn't realize there were and that's 
a poor part of planning. I didn't realize there were vendors over there. Like it was I just saw, like I said, it was three booths. I, like I saw one of them was the PAX like vendor, like the PAX official gear stuff. No, that was that's not even what I'm talking about. Well, like, like I they saw were in two different of, spots. Yeah, yeah, I know which booth you're talking about because there were three PAX merchandise. Yeah. So like I saw one of the booths were just PAX mer- merchandise. I was like, oh, well, that's just the merch table for the convention. I didn't go over there to bother even looking. Yeah, but I will say, like, kind of the down, like, the lack of stuff to do on the expo, necessarily, there were still, it seemed like there were more free play tables than mm-hmm. last year. Um, Maybe not all of them were free play, <laughs> and they were just being used that way. Yeah. But I think the one time it took me two whole minutes to find a spot for four people to sit down mm-hmm. with, like, games from the library, and, like, the library had a lot of games to choose from and it's just you go up there they scan your badge and you take the game yeah like the library is one of my more favorite things of the convention itself like i don't because last year and this year i i only went for a day i don't really get to spend a lot of time playing those games um it is like one of the cooler ideas yeah is to be able like oh this game i'm kind of interested in i want to figure out how to play it and then play it to see if i want to go buy it yeah, exactly. So I want to say, I don't know if, if you had the same experience or not, but I feel like this is probably the year that we did the least demos on the show floor. Oh, 100%. I mean, we did... Erica well, and I did two, technically, and I think you also so did and two. I did, so we did Sausage Party, and you did that wrestling game? Oh, right, right. I did, I did yep. one. I did one this year. Oh, yeah, that's true, because you just did the, the on-tour game, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it be, yeah. between it being more crowded and there being less stuff to demo it was just a little yeah it was i i kind of wish they would bring back that media hour they did the first year yeah that was actually cool where you got to just walk the floor and like that was hella useful yeah just to like just to check things out to see like what was worth circling back to Mm -hmm. yeah but you know i still had a good time yeah oh yeah no totally um and even with lack of Lack of demo stuff that we got to do. Uh, we still actually played a fair number of games between the three of us. Yeah. So, Rich, you played that on tour dice game, I guess, right? Uh, yeah. It's not a dice game. It's um, it's a it is a board game uh that uses dice. I'm trying to figure out who actually makes. Well, here you talk about it. I'll look game. up who makes it. Um, it, it it it's called on tour, and basic idea um is like you're a band going okay. on tour. Uh, cross country tour, and it's a very it's it, it's very reminiscent to me at least to like Ticket to Ride. Okay. The game consists of anywhere between twenty five to depending on your rolls twenty five to fifty turns, which sounds like a lot, but it's like you roll the dice, it's two d tens, and you get two numbers. Say you get one and seven, you roll a seventeen and a seventy one. You then flip over three location cards so it could be east north and west it could be east central and west it could be east east and north um depending on what that what it lists and it has a few states on each of those location cards you then have to put a 17 and a 71 in one of each of them okay at the end of the game after you have all the states filled out you have to go from the lowest number you have to the highest number you can without doubling back onto the same state or a, pre, a number lower than the number you're on to go on tour. So it looks like this was kickstarted. Uh, pro- Sh- I, I, shocking. A yeah. board game kickstarted? No, no really. <laughs> um, but, so it was kickstarted this year. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, there's like, there's different rules. Like if, uh, if you use one of the states that pops up on the location card, you, you can circle it and that's worth two points if you cross through it. Um, if you roll doubles, you get a wild. If you, if your three location cards are all the same uh, region, you get a wild in that region. It's it, it's a neat concept. It it's very easy and um, fun. Like I enjoyed it. I, I I thought about buying it. Actually, ju- I should rephrase that. It shipped this year. Okay. It looks like the actual Kickstarter ran like spring of 2018. So that's actually a pretty good turnaround for a board game, though. Oh yeah. Like a year and a half. Not bad. Yeah, no, no, not even a, yeah, I guess, no, not even a year and a half, less than a year. So it looks, it, the, the Kickstarter ended June 14th, and it looks like they were fully shipped by 
February, March 2019. Would you, so less than a year to yeah met to to fund, manufacture, and ship most of the games. Yeah, it's it's pretty sweet. And um, the cool thing they did with um with the show floor is they brought basically a um customized craps table. Yeah, which was really actually pretty. It, cool. it was really cool. They brought a customized craps table, and the game is meant for up to four players initially. You can buy, if you buy multiple kits of it, you can play up to, I think 12 is the highest. You, I, you can probably play 30 people if you want. It's completely up to you. Yeah, the, the, the thing literally says one player, four player, eight player, 12 player plus. Yeah. It's just depending on how many game boards you have. Um, I really enjoyed it and I, I'm, I, I might get it within the next couple of months. Um, I just I I had already spent so much money this past weekend that I decided not to, and uh, I was going to uh, at the time I was also going to buy one of those booster boxes. Right. Yeah. Which I I went through the games that I got on my booster box. One of them is called Ortis Regni. It's the big black box that you saw. Is that the one that was um actually like pretty heavy that didn't fit in your bag? Yeah. The game seems really fun. Really. Yeah. It. it uh. The cards are really cool. They don't have any words on them. Because so they're just pictures? They're just pictures, and you get, like, identification. Uh, you get, like, a linen piece of fabric next to each player that, like, says what each what each card is. That's why to, like, make it look a little bit nicer and stuff like that. And it, it's basically uh, your two Earls um, that are trying to become, like, that are trying to take out the other one. Okay. And, it, like, it, there's a lot of pieces, and it looks complicated, but it it's re- relatively simple. Each team gets 90 cards. You have to make from that 90 cards, you have to make a 24 deck, a uh, 24 card deck, build up your army and your lands and your 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 kingdom and defend from being attacked and make the other person basically die before you die by either attacking them, making them card out before you do or deck out, not card out or uh like coming to a draw and them conceding. It's really neat. Yeah, it's, it does, yeah, that does actually sound pretty yeah. cool. I, I watched an hour and twenty minute long video. Jesus, it was it was uh, about a half hour of it was how to play, and then uh, the rest of it was three playthrough. Oh, okay. One game took about twenty minutes. The other oh, so game, it's not very long. The other game took about five, and then the third game took about fifteen. That's cool. At least yeah. It's not like super long. Yeah. Uh, so ne- next up, Drew and I, um, along with our wives, uh, demoed a game called Sausage Party. Yeah. Um. Which we just kind of actually stumbled upon, uh, but it, it was actually a kind of a cool game. Yeah, it was a neat little four-player party game thing. Yeah, it it reminded me a little bit of like that Go Nuts for Donuts, only a little more um, fast-paced than that game, because that game is very much a you have time to kind of stop and think about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sausage Party was more of a the, uh, what just was fucking the, throw was the cards spit? down. Bit is that the like. I think I know what you're talking about. Card game that's kind of like you, you're playing like up or down one number card on either pile and trying to like. Yeah, get rid I of know what you're cards. talking. I do know what you're talking about. Yes, yeah, so it's everyone's playing at the same time. It's not like turns, and you're and trying. This son of a bitch doesn't even listen. No, he's I'm not. listening. I'm he's not. <laughs> I am. You you play in turns. It's no, uh, no. You don't play in turns, <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> Jesus. So, I, no, I'm listening. I'm I was going to say the complete opposite of what all. you guys just I, said. I heard words. I heard you say something about playing in turns. Look, I'm paying my uncle, okay? All right. Uh, but, uh, uh it, the, so the purpose of the game is to build the perfect, um, hot dog, essentially. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and every card is numbered. And, um, I forget that the, there was like a, a certain number that you wanted to get, wasn't it? Well, oh, you wanted to match the, the, number- the number of cards with the number on yeah was the pot the number you want to get on that pile before you put a bun yeah on that stack so like if the card not if if you drew a a card with a seven on it you needed to get seven sevens stacked Uh before you basically wiped them off the board to get the points for them okay if somebody threw an extra card on top though you then lost points for it so if I got up to seven and then drew through another seven on top of that before I got a bun card to put on top, there'd be eight, and I would then lose points for that stack rather than gain them. Okay. Um, so the whole thing with the game is you're sitting there playing like two, three, or four people, and you're just throwing cards on your own area plus on the other people. Yeah. So you're kind of watching everybody play at once and trying to 
sabotage them as they go while also trying to get yours yeah. as many points as possible. But, like, you have your eyes on 12 different spots at a time, because each player has three sausages that they're building on their mat. And at any time, you can just discard a whole pile, but you then lose you all those points. You can't gain any points for yeah. them. Uh, and you play until someone reaches the, the final bun from their deck, which is the always the last card in the pot, their deck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so once they get that and play it, game over. And okay. then you just... So, like, if you're slow and you have, like, three quarters of your deck, or three quarters, if you have, like, a quarter of your deck left and somebody else has gotten through all of theirs, you're probably losing because you're going to have a bunch of cards in your hand plus a bunch of cards in your deck that you never got to go through. Yeah. So, it was it was fun, though. It was, you know... Well, wasn't hard to figure out, but no. dep- depending on who you're playing with, I imagine that it could get very competitive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. It was cool, though. I think it was like a $20 game also. So Yeah, it couldn't have been too much. One, one the, of those fun like little cool party too. games. The what? The art on the cards was funny. Yeah. And there were... There yeah, were... It was all like slightly pun on sausages. And there were like some condiment cards that counted as wild, if I remember correctly. Yeah, there was like... Mus- uh, I think there were mustard cards. Yeah. So you know, it was yeah. it was cool though. Yeah, Def- definitely one of those fun sort of like warm up games if you're having like a game night. Yeah, and like not everyone's there yet, but some people. Yeah, you're just trying playing. to kill time. Mm-hmm. Let's see what's next. Um, so I forget when this was. I think it was after you guys left on Friday. Erica and I went over and grabbed a game out of uh, the library to kind of just wrap up the day, and we got this game called Witches of the Revolution. Okay. Which, it's a cooperative cart, like, deck building game. Um, yeah. Where it's only two players, but the whole idea is you are trying to defeat tyranny in the revolution, but you are also covens of witches. And you pick from, I want to say it was four or five potential um, covens. And then there's all these other cards that you can recruit as you're playing. So there, there's kind of a lot of moving pieces to the game. Yeah. Um. So, you know, like like those um social deduction games, like like Secret Hitler or Avalon, mm-hmm. where there's like an objective that you're trying to do, and you you either agree to do the objective or you fail it, and that moves like your token either towards winning or towards losing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It kind of took in some of those characteristics, where each turn you had a an event card that you flip over that was something you were trying to succeed at, and then you had stacks of victory conditions i guess would be the best way to put them it was like recruiting benjamin franklin and you know shit like that um and you would ha- your cards would have different um values to them so you know t- just to make it simpler like earth fire wind water essentially like they- they'd they have those symbols and you needed kind of like the the mountain climbing game did mm-hmm. you would have to beat one of the event card symbols which it always had two different ones with at least one of the cards that you had, um, or a combination of them. So you could play four cards down to beat one, but then you just lost four cards from your deck. So you kind of had to be strategic about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and every time you didn't clear one of these events, it would build up, and every other turn, there would be some sort of negative effect for them. So one of the negative effects was it moved your tyranny meter closer to tyranny versus democracy i guess i think was the other side of it yeah if that gets all the way down game over you lose so there's like three different lose scenarios to the game but really only one win scenario <laughs> so it it was interesting though and it it probably took probably took about an hour to play through a round of it um mostly because we were we were learning as we went so we played like a round or two up front just to kind of figure out like how things were supposed to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then actually played like a full real game of it. Um, It's definitely not a party game because it's only two players, but it, it was a fun game to kind of just sit down and sort of play through for like an hour. Yeah, sure. And because it had so many moving parts, there were a lot of, there was actually a lot of strategy to it to try and figure out what made the most sense. Like, do we let this one move up so that we can sort of build decks a little bit stronger to then take out multiple on the next turn sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let me see what else we have on here. So, Drew, you played a demo for a wrestling game that I do not know the name of. Uh, it's SRG Super Show. Uh, it, 
And actually, this was the thing I noticed at PAX Unplugged this year. I saw at least three different wrestling-themed games around the show. Uh, this was the only one that was like uh, had a booth presence. Uh, yeah, one that had like a big booth presence yeah, too, didn't like it? up in the very front through one of the entrances. Um, so it's a card-based wrestling game. Uh, and the cool thing they have like actual licensed independent wrestlers like uh, well like kenny omega is probably the biggest name Mm -hmm. they have a lot of all all of the elite guys kenny omega the young bucks adam page that you can buy their character card i know one of those names (laughs) from video games yeah so every card has a different well they all have six abilities strength technical submissions etc and a different rating from one through ten for each of those and then they all have like a little ability that like used your thing to shuffle a card back into your deck or whatever. The objective of the game is to get off a finishing move, which you play a card and they'll be they'll use one of your different abilities and you roll the die to like see which of you gets the higher ability score to see if your move succeeds or fails kind of thing. And then you have to play an opener move then a follow-up, and then you get the ability to play a finishing move card if you draw one from your deck. Once a player plays a finishing move card, you have to try to beat whatever score they got for their finisher to be able to kick out, and you have three chances to roll one of your ability scores that is equal to or higher than whatever the number you have to beat. And if you don't do it on the three rolls, you're pinned. And so the game can go pretty quick depending on how the cards go, or it can wind up drawing out for a while because some of the cards will have a counter. So like if it'll say, stop a follow-up grapple move, and if someone plays a follow-up grapple and you have that stop card, you can play it immediately and counter their move, and now it's your turn. It'll move back and forth like that. So it was pretty neat. Uh, it's definitely something we'll pick up and like take to our friends when we go for the big wrestling events wrestlemania and get there super early or are there for seven hours i was gonna say because i mean isn't wrestlemania just 27 hours of wrestling pretty much pretty much it's 27 hours over the course of half a day hey wrestle kingdom new japan's main show they made into fucking two days now that's i mean isn't wrestlemania technically like three days with all of the stuff they do well (laughs) yes but wrestlemania itself might as well be over three days with how long it was but yeah, so, you know, and like they have a bunch of made up wrestlers, a bunch of very clearly inspired by real wrestler, wrestler cards. And then, like I said, actual licensed wrestlers. Yeah, I'm sure it's very expensive. And I'm not saying this in a sarcastic way. I'm sure it's very expensive to get some of those wrestlers uh, licensing. Mm-hmm. I imagine like, anybody from the WWE was probably just the licensing that you'd have to go through to use any of them is probably oh, absurd. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Cuz I mean at that point you're not just paying the wrestler, you're also paying the company. Like mm-hmm. imagine, like I'm sure if they wanted Hulk Hogan's, it would be off the wall oh, from yeah. him to start. Yeah, but who wants anything to do with that guy? Sure. sure. He's but yeah, old, he's leathery, he's racist. A no neat, one needs that. Quick little very well thought out game as well. Like, oh, that's good. Like you can when looking through the cards, you can see the like this is uh, follows the logic of a pro wrestling match kind of thing. Yeah. So I was like, you know what? I like this. This is cool. That's cool. Um, now, the two of us played a handful of stuff between Saturday and Sunday also. Mm-hmm. Um, I figure we'll just run through them real quick because they, they were just stuff we grabbed out of the library. Yeah. So we played a game called um, Pretend to Grown Up. I believe was the the vernacular they used. Uh, I, mean, I wrote it down. You I'm just wrote not pretending looking at it. to grown up. Yeah, that sounds yes. right. That, yeah, that sounds more right. Yeah, pretending to grown up. Um, it, it's basically a bluffing game. Yeah, where it, you have cards. There's a deck of cards you're pulling from. Every card has some sort of um set of values on it. It was um time, time money, energy, and, and money, right? Yeah. And you're basically you, you pick a card on your turn. You put it face down. You're like, I bet I have the most time. And everyone else puts down their cards saying that they have the most time. And when you flip them over, whoever has actually has the most time gets all those cards as points, basically. So it's like bullshit. Yeah. Pretty much. Okay. Yeah, kind of. Because, yeah, like you might have a card that only says 
two on it, mm-hmm. but you go, I have the most time. If nobody else throws down a card, you get a point for yours at least. Yeah. But then the minute – so it's basically you go in a circle, and the first person to decline putting a card down ends the turn. Okay. So if all th- – all, if all other players play a card too, then there's more points to be had in mm-hmm. that round. Yeah. Whereas, like, if it's like, well, I don't trust Drew to be telling the truth. Fuck it, I'm not going to put anything down. Or all the cards I have that he said is the thing he's going for, all my numbers blow. So I'm not even going to risk giving him an extra point because certainly has something better than I do. Yeah. Yeah, and there there are some like modifier cards and there were a set of red cards that made things slightly more challenging. Mm-hmm. Um sometimes they had higher values, sometimes they actually had lower or this one actually had negative values, didn't they? I don't know that any had negative. Um but some of some of like the the modifiers helped out a little bit because there was a um I forget what the unicorn did, but I remember the unicorn was helpful. Didn't it like add one to each of your Yeah. So there was like literally like a little unicorn figure that you, rather than playing a card on your turn, you could take that, mm-hmm. and any other person could take it from you after that. But while you had it, you got like an extra point or something like that. Yeah. F- to each of your your things. So so if you said like I have the most time and you had five time, you had six while you had that unicorn. Mm. Okay. And like one of the modifier cards you you could play with your other stuff basically just said I get this for two turns and no one can take it. Okay. Yeah. It was a fun little game. Didn't yeah. take too long. I think we played like three rounds of it in a span of a half hour mm-hmm. at most. And, you know, so it's pretending to, to adult, uh, like, all the things are like adult activities and, you know, re- very well representative. Not not either. like sexually no, like charged adult activities. Doing work or like... Ending a relationship or starting a relationship, and and all, like, all of the artwork on the cards, not all of it, but a large chunk of it, seemed to be like commissioned from things like Cyanide and Happiness or the Oatmeal or yeah. um, other familiar looking things that I can't think of the names yeah. of right now. Lo- lots of popular web comics. Yeah, nice. So, yeah, it was a fun little game. Um, and then we also played the one called Lost Cities, right. Which was a treasure hunting game. We actually played two different treasure hunting games. I liked this one more than the mountain one. I don't know. I kind of like the the mountain one more. M- mountain personally. of Madness sounded really fun. It that is. was cool. I, I like it. Um, but I, I, I both were good. Both are very good. Yeah, they're they're different enough too mm-hmm. that you don't necessarily want to compare them beyond the fact that both of their objectives were to try and gather more points than everybody else. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, in, in Lost Cities, you were on an expedition, you have five expedition, four? I thought it was four small and one big. I think it was three small and one big. You have multiple pieces I that, could, uh, yeah. you, that you can send to different dig sites, essentially. And one of them is a- Oh no, it is five. There are five different colors, right? There was green, blue, yellow, white, and red? Yes. Okay, so- Um, so each path is a color, as Drew just kind of like alluded to. And you take your character, your pieces, and the small ones are just expedition people, adventurers. Anything that any points that they get are just worth one point. Or well, yeah, they're worth or, whatever. Yeah, the whatever the value of it is. Yeah, anything that the larger one, which is like the researcher, finishes on, is worth double. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's your first. It was the first three spots on each p- path were actually worth negative points. Mm-hmm. So you have to be careful to get your pieces moved along before a round ends. Otherwise, you might actually lose points rather than gaining points. Yeah. It was basically like it was like negative 20, negative 15, negative 10, and then it started going positive. Yeah. Um, the way that you moved your pieces were it was all card based. The cards were all color coordinated and they had a number value. So it was one of those games where you had to put cards in sequential order to move mm-hmm. and you could never go backwards. Mm-hmm. So if your first card that you played of the of the green path was eight. You had to either play another eight or higher, and the cards only went to ten. Okay. So at a certain point, you're probably fucked if you started at a high number. Yeah. Yep. Um, but you could start paths. You could start any amount of paths that you wanted throughout it at any given time. Yeah. Um. The the sort of the the end of a phase was when um was it five or six five when five different pieces made it across a bridge, which each path had a bridge and then two more spaces to the end. Mm-hmm. So once five people <clears throat> crossed the bridge, that round of expeditions was over, and you tallied up all your points. Okay. Now, as you're going, 
there's little pieces on the boards that either are relics that you're collecting that actually get you points later on, or um, basically shoots from shoots and ladders that just bumped you up one more space. They are all laid randomly, though. So when yeah. you start the game, part of the board setup is basically mixing all these pieces up and then just putting them down in random spots without looking at them. Yeah. So you could end up in a position where maybe like one path, there's like three of these bumps in a row. Mm-hmm. So you can get out of the negative in just one turn. Whereas other ones, maybe it's all just relics so that you have to hope that you just have enough pieces to land on them before somebody else does. Yep. Yeah. It was neat, though. And yeah. It is definitely a longer game. It probably a, a full game probably takes about an hour. Probably. I didn't realize it until you started explaining it. I've played that before. Really? Oh, yes, I've played it at uh, a different game night. And thanks for the is, invite. <laughs> it wasn't my game night. I'm just saying, thanks for inviting yeah, us. But, but I have played that, and it is a fun game. Yeah, we only that was the that was the most like classic board game we yeah. played over the over the weekend. Yeah, yeah, I think we only played one round yeah. of that. Like we didn't do a complete expedition. Because the full expedition was actually three rounds. Yeah. Um, but we did the one. It probably took us maybe like half an hour ish, maybe a little less, twenty minutes. Probably. Um, and we were going to. There was something else we were going to go do, so we kind of called it there. But it was yeah. fun. We, I, I definitely enjoyed it. Which I also remember. There's, there's another game that I did demo that I, 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 for, I literally just remembered. And well, uh, it's not on the outline, so fuck you. It's it. This is a quick one. This is a quick. All one. right. Uh, it's called Elevator Pitch. It's from the guys who made Red Flags and games like that. Uh, you basically, you pull uh, a premise card and a, like a butt card basically for movies. And it's like, premise, think Ghost uh, Buster. But they're all children. And you have to try to sell that movie to an executive. And the executive can give you notes. I like that idea, but what if they're all afraid of sunlight or something like that? Okay, so it's very Red Flags, it's- but... Yeah, and you have to sell that pitch and get them to buy your pitch. So, like, you can have multiple people with one executive. Or uh, one of the things that uh, the guy was saying was he likes to play it with teams. So teams of two to where they you're working in tandem with each other to try to sell this, this movie pitch. That's actually kind of cool. Yeah, I thought yeah. It was just, I'm not big into those kinds of, like card games like Red Flags or Cards Against Humanity, but this one I was like, I could get behind. I don't know, I think, I, I like Red Flags. That game's fun. It's fun. It when... only works if you're playing with friends. Yeah. The minute you add people that don't know each other to it, it becomes less fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um. There's all, there's another game that we have that's kind of like that too, called Cult, mm-hmm. where you're, you, you basically are drawing cards to form a cult, and then you have to sell the other people on joining your cult. Yeah. Um. That seems kind of cool, though. Yeah. Uh. Let's see, what's next? So, I think it was while we were waiting for Drew and Sarah to get there on Saturday, maybe. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think you guys w- went to that panel first thing Saturday morning, right? Yes. Um, we were wandering, and we ended up playing this game called Obelisk. That I'm pretty sure the dude who was demoing it was just h- him and a bunch of other like game designers just bought passes and set up at tables. Like they probably couldn't afford actual booths, so they just brought their games and like set up at like the free play tables. Yeah. <laughs> Which you know what? Fucking why not? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but this is a, uh, a procedurally generated tower defense game is probably the easiest way to put it. Okay. Um, so every time you play, the board is different because the board is just a, like five by five grid of cards, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Um, so you, you literally shuffle the cards, lay them all and just lay them out in the five by five grid. Um, and then you remove, there's three or four, um, blank spaces that you remove afterwards. And the whole point of the game is one card in the deck is a portal that could end up anywhere in the board, and monsters spawn from that portal. Mm -hmm. And you basically have to use your turns to turn the cards so that their arrows are pointing certain directions to have the monsters follow as much of the board as possible without either crossing their path or going off the board. So basically going into any empty spaces. Mm -hmm. Um. And then while you're doing that, you also are building towers, which are just basically dice that the number faced up on the dice is how powerful the tower would be. Yeah. Um, and the monsters are colored based on how fast they move around the board, like how many how many blocks they move per turn, and how many how what level of a tower you need to, you need to defeat it. Okay. And then each tower can only collect one monster per cycle. So if you also, every round, you spawn six monsters. Mm-hmm. So it's like six monsters at a time. 
they move around the board at different speeds, and you can only technically capture one per tower. So there's kind of a lot of uh, there's a lot of planning that has to go into it, like from the very get go. Oh yeah, because you obviously per turn you can either you can turn three tiles to to affect which direction they're going in, but you can only turn a tile once. So there's a marker you put on each tile. Once you turn it once, you remove that marker. That tile can't be turned again. Okay. Um, you can also lay a um, lay a dice down for, as a tower. Depending on how many people you're playing with determines how many towers each person has. So I think if you're playing by yourself, you get four, four or five towers. And then it basically goes down a tower for like each uh, person that plays. Okay. To I think you can play up to four players. If there's four players, each person gets two towers they can lay down. Mm. Um. But yes, yeah, so you can lay down a tower, or you can upgrade a tower if you've collected enough resources being, like, collected monsters, basically. Yeah. Um, there's also some other ways that you can go about it. You can sacrifice um, dice to immediately upgrade an, an, an existing tower, stuff like that. But then you're also limiting how many towers you have to play. Yeah. So, like, it, it's a cool, very well-thought-out game. Sounds neat. Yeah. Sounds like something uh, me and Eric would both be definitely to play. Yeah, like I, th- I, I think you would actually have a have a lot of fun with it. Um, when we played the demo of it, we, we, we it, there was just another random person that played too, and we actually managed to win. Yeah. Um, when we, we were playing Sunday morning while we were waiting for Drew and Sarah and lost. Okay. <laughs> so you know, yeah. can go either way. Yeah. Um, because the monster spawns, excuse me, are random too. You're supposed to base either get like a black bag to put the pieces in or close your eyes and pick them at random. Yeah. So, you know, it's the green ones are the easiest to capture, but they also move four spaces per turn. And at a certain point, you're just going to run out of board no matter what you do. Yeah. Because they can't cross over the same spot twice. So, mm-hmm. um, whereas like the blue pieces move the slowest, they only move one space at a time, I believe, maybe two. Two. They move two spaces at a time, but they require a level five tower to destroy them. Yeah. And some spaces actually have modifiers that make ev- make any monster on that space cost more. So, you know, if you have a blue piece and you have a five, level 5 tower, but that blue piece lands on a level 1 thing, you then have to have that tower upgraded to 6 in order to clear it. Yeah. And, you know, that can be hard to do. <laughs> yeah. That sounds fun. I, I, I like that idea. Yeah, I'll show it to you sometime. Awesome. So, we did buy it. Cause, Sweet. Yeah. Because the guy that made it... um. He's from, like, the Ohio area. I think mm-hmm. he said Cleveland. And, like, that's where the game's available. Like, he has it in a few small stores, like, where he's from. They don't have it. Like, it's not something you can just buy on Amazon right now, unfortunately. Okay. But, you know, he, he it was needs, neat. He needs to go on to uh, Shark Tank and sell it. Is that show still on? I don't know. Maybe. I don't have TV. Almost certainly is, but I don't think that's something that would ever fly on a Shark Tank. Probably not. I. You know what I did, didn't know? Famous Amos, the cookie dude. He apparently was on one of those at one point, trying to pitch a new type of cookie, and they did not go for it. I mean, he was on The Office. That's why I looked him up, actually, because I just got to that episode. <laughs> well, not I'm, I'm like maybe like four. They just got back from Florida. Yeah, like two episodes ago. Yeah. So what's her face is now in charge. Um, Catherine she's, Tate. She's the worst. Yeah, she seems pretty bad. She is the worst. She's an awesome actress. She's the worst. I don't. But honestly, um, James Spader is definitely worse than she is. Ah. Uh. I but also, know. wonderful actor. I love James Spader. Yeah. yeah. But I, 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 I'm on, I'm like halfway through season eight. Nice. So, um, Drew, do you want to talk about Mountains of Madness? Yeah, I mean, well, we should. It was cool. Well, uh, I, I was asking if you'd like to explain it, you son of a bitch. Well, uh, I guess the simplest explanation is you are an expedition trying to climb up this mountain and then escape. Is there um, madness? Yes. So. Is there an of? No. Oddly oh, enough, shit. somehow no they no in connecting. The they lied in the title. There is mountain and madness, but the mountain the madness is not of the mountain. Okay, uh, are we sure about that? I don't know. Yeah, that's part I, of the game. <laughs> I'm I'm going mad just thinking. So you're on an expedition. There's uh, I think it's three to five players was the limit for it. So uh, the that four, sounds right. Yeah, the four of us played uh, me, Cobb, and the two wives. Um, you're trying to move yourself up and off this mountain by completing the different tasks that each tile that you go through will have two to three different objectives to complete which are just getting enough points of the four different four different types yeah so it was weapons crates crates books and tools yes 
um, where you get numbered cards, and you know you might have two cards that have a total of eight tool cards that have books. Between the four or five, how many ever of you are playing, you're trying to complete those two tasks to get the reward from the thing and to not get any failures. And mm-hmm. every one of those tasks usually is either a very short range, like you need to get between 11 and 14, 14 or or so, uh, uh, once you get higher up the mountain, it's occasionally one or the other. So it's you need seven or 12. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Not like, eight. It can't be in that eight to 11. It's got to be seven or 12, like one or the other. Um, also, but, as it starts getting further up, each of those four items has a, co- a specific color. And the first row of things, it shows the right color on the chip and you flip it. So it'll say, have the yellow symbol for the tool, symbol for the books. As you go up, it starts either just removing colors or swapping colors around. Because you're going crazy. Because you're going crazy. And that probably plays into effect with some of the madness cards that you are gaining as you're struggling to get up the mountain. Which are, the madnesses are all just like weird quirks, mm-hmm. basically. Well, that at least that we got. Well, f- all, fair. So That's like, all we got. Erica got one that she had to sit on the floor for the majority of the game, mm-hmm. yeah. which sucks because we were at the convention where it's like she was just sitting on the convention floor, unable to really see the table. Um, I know Drew had the one where he had to make a finger mustache. Yeah, uh, most of the time. Well, so I had to have a finger mustache and would only communicate with other people that also had finger mustaches. <laughs> but I can't tell them that that's my quirk. They just have to realize that while I'm sitting there with my hand across my finger over my my lip that i'm not talking to them and you know hmm. like i had one that i had to high five everybody before i could play a card during like the the trying to beat in a thing turn and and if somebody refused to high five you i would i wouldn't be able to play cards the other thing is you have 30 seconds to play your cards so that's 30 seconds to see what's needed look at your cards and discuss with people before somebody plays a card because mm-hmm. once the first card gets played face down you're not supposed to talk anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, it the, is hard. The leader can play whoever is the leader for that turn, which it just rotates after every turn, can use one of the leadership tokens you have to add 30 seconds, but that is a, f- a limited resource and becomes finite. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, like there, there are certain conditions where they get removed from the game entirely, and if you run out of them completely, it's game over. Like, you fail. And you only have six to start. Okay. And, and we didn't to, realize for the first three quarters of the game that the the rest option wasn't telling us that you don't need to spend a a, a token. token. It was telling us that you need to discard a token. Like, from the game, not oh, just geez. put it in the discard pile. It was, you can, and the rest option is the thing that lets you reshuffle the deck of cards. Because okay. a lot of the, a lot of the bad, so if, like Drew was saying, every single task you have has at, generally at least two win conditions. If you succeed at one of them, you get the the point for the card. Like you get to pick whatever, ever the, thing the it's telling you. You get you whatever the, the benefit is. Mm-hmm. Um, if you fail one of them, you still fail that, and you have the bad stuff happen. Yeah. So you want to pass both of them so that no bad stuff happens. But that seems to be hard. Yeah. Um. So almost every turn, you have at least one bad thing that's happening. Which could be as simple as, like, you just have to draw an injury card and put it into your deck. And the injury cards are basically, at the end of the game, you count all of, like, the whole deck. And if you have more injuries in the deck of cards than you do um, relics between all of the players, you lose. Mm -hmm. Because that means that the expedition was not worth the cost that it it held. Yeah. Um, But some of the, the bad stuff is also just discarding cards based on how big of a gap there was between what you put down and what the goal actually was. Mm -hmm. So if you fuck up and nobody put down any books and you need 13 books, you have to discard 13 cards. If you needed five books, but somehow you ended up with 30 books, you have to discard 25 cards. (laughs) Um, It was never that bad for us, but still. There was one where it was like 17. (laughs) Well, so we failed two different, both expeditions on the card, and then the dice, it's a dice roll to figure yeah. out that stuff. Both dice rolls were discard cards. So. Oh, man. 
And if you don't have enough cards to discard, you discard a leadership token. And if you don't have any leadership tokens left on the board to put in the discard pile, you remove one from the discard from the game. Yeah, like, so the, like, the game is it is definitely stacked to lose. Yeah, um, it is far. It is a far easier game to fail at than to succeed at. Yeah, I, I that's probably more of the fun of the game though. Yeah, yeah, and it it definitely is hard with the between the time and the lack of ability to really communicate and all the madness things and being that we were kind of we had never played it before and we're just kind of like playing as reading the rules. There were definitely pieces that we didn't realize we were either doing wrong or that we mm-hmm. weren't doing at all until later in the game. But it was mm-hmm. still fun. Yes. Yeah. Um what else was there? Um when when you got there, Rich, on Sunday. Yeah. We played Hako Hako Ona. Yes. Which was a Another proced- procedurally generated uh, hide and seek game. Yes, it was, I, I was looking it up earlier today or the other day. It's uh, origin. It was originally Japanese. Yeah, like it's it, very. It's it's, it's very it's, Japanese. It's new to the United States within like the past two or three years, I believe. Like it's like it's a relatively older game in Japan that like they there was no translations for it up until like the past couple years. Yeah, I did see that online too. Um, it was cool though because it it was a game where one person was the ghost, the Hako Ona, mm-hmm. and then everybody else are people exploring this house of this little girl that was basically accidentally murdered by her father and then left in the house that she mm-hmm. now haunts. Yeah. Um. And you, you, when you start the game, each player that's not the ghost actually decides where a piece of the house layout goes. Yeah. So you build the layout of the house from scratch each time, and each time it's going to end up being slightly different, and that affects how how the gameplay goes, because there are, uh, I guess th- there's two real win scenarios? Cause the, the I think wins... it was three. Three win scenarios. It was uh, give her back her doll. Yeah. And escape out the secret exit. Oh, and find her weakness. And find her weakness, and 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 then like kill her with it or something. like Yeah. That. So it, it was find the combination to the the safe to get the keys, and then find the secret exit, or find the doll and then find the bones to like release make, the spirit or whatever. Yeah, you make her happy. Or find out what her weakness is and then find her and use the the weakness on her. Yeah. Um. And then the the loose scenarios where basically everybody dies. Or you get to a point where nobody can figure out, or there's no move that the visitors can make that wouldn't cause them to die. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it's it ends up being the the players decide the board, and then the ghost player randomly places tokens down, and then everyone has to close their eyes, and the ghost player gets to place themselves on the board and basically rearrange another piece. Yeah. So. Nobody was going to know where the ghost player is starting, um, but there's different factors in the game where th- there was a scream thing that I never did that on my turn I could have screamed, which would I would get some sort of perk, but I would also have to tell everybody what room I was in. But it was easier for me to just use the move ability and just move to the rooms that like you guys were in so that you would then hopefully look underneath the tile that I was in and die. Yeah. Which happened to you. Yeah, I died because I used my special <laughs> item, which, uh, not realizing he was in the room that I was in, if you use a special item and they're in the room you're in, you die. Just Yep. Just just because you die. And I'm like, that's it's kind of annoying. But at and least when at least when you die, you also become a vengeful spirit. Yeah. And then you so you get to keep playing, you're not just out of the game. Okay, yeah, that's neat. Yeah, and the game has this um this noise factor where the only time the ghost player gets to go is if noise is made, essentially. Like, there are a few cards that would let the ghost player go, like, interrupt on the spot. But generally, it's a, a player takes their turn, makes a noise during their turn, the ghost player gets to go, and then the the previous player resumes their turn. Mm-hmm. We played with the, the card method for noise, which was just easier to do in, like, a convention setting. Yeah. Where it's basically just a three-by-three three grid of numbered cards, and you just keep flipping them until they hit 11. Once you hit 11, noise has been made, the ghost player goes, and the cards reset. Um, the traditional thing is actually these little wooden circle pieces that you stack on a little bubbled piece of cardboard 
and then one of the the pieces you're stacking also has a bubble in it. So you have to stack these things on top of each other that do not sit flatly on each other. Huh. And the one that you're placing on top can fall off and you can pick it up and put it back on until it sits there. But the minute they either all fall off of the base bubble or more than just the top piece falls off while you're placing it, you have made noise and it's now the ghost's turn to like do whatever it is they want to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was a fun game though. Yeah, it was. It, I wish we would have been able to like actually get through the game. Yeah, it ended up um, definitely being a little bit longer than we realized and took a little while to set up because there were a lot of... Yeah, there was a ton of rules, so it took a while to set up. Then once it was set up, we made it through a good number of rounds. It's just... Yeah, we realized it was getting kind of late and yeah. everyone's... Like, we wanted to do like another like once over on the floor and there were a few other things that we kind of yeah. wanted to hit up and check out before everything wrapped up on Sunday. Yeah. Um, and I think the last thing we played was that card game that you got out of your booster box. Yeah, I got a card game called Bitten, where it's basically your, your survivors in the zombie apocalypse, and you just went out on a supply run. As you get back, you are convinced one of you has been bitten by a zombie. Uh, so the object of the game is to discover who was bitten, or, uh, get all the, uh, get all the supplies that you need. And get the fuck out of and there. And get get out of dodge. Or if you were bitten, make like wait and like make the game last. Which I mean, if you were bitten, it's also gather all the pieces and get the fuck out of there. Yeah, that without too. being caught. But like you win if you're not caught and no one gets out of dodge. Yeah. Um. Because it was what's the timer? Fifteen minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. So oh, you, that's right. I, I forgot. Yes. Yeah. So Drew, this game actually has a set five minutes. Nice. And so. It, if you you have if you, uh, you run out of cards in the deck and you have to reshuffle, you're reshuffling in the five minutes. You don't pause it. You just you have five minutes to figure out who the zombie is or to get out of there. And it's basically one of those. You can do one thing on your turn. You either you can either pick up a card or play a card. Yeah. So like, there's not really any. There shouldn't be any reason that you're just sitting there not doing anything on your turn. Like, by the time it's your turn, you should be ready to either draw a card mm-hmm. or play a card and know kind of what you want to do. Mm-hmm. And then the cards you can play vary based on if it's... it. The cards are either going to have a resource name on it, like food or water or weapons or whatever. And in that case, you just play one of those and then you get to take one of those items either from the stash in the middle of the board or directly off of somebody if... Yeah. um if there aren't any left on the board, or if you just want to be a dick. Then there's a raid card that you can play that only allows you to take it from another player. Yeah. Um, Then you can, like, accuse people of being bitten, which allows you to take a card from their hand, but if you take a card from their hand... uh, I can't remember what it was called. So there was a backstab uh, and a shank card? Yeah, if you take shank... No, if you take backstab, if you take the backstab when you're accusing somebody, you are out of the game. If you take the shank card, the shank card was, you get to hold on to that. That was, you have Oh, a that's right. That was a weapon it was, replacement. I, I can't confess. If you take the confess card and you are bitten, you have to admit that you are bitten. And the game's over and you lose and everybody else wins. Okay. It, but, it, yeah, it was, if you manage to gather all of the supplies, though, which was a weapon, a food, a water, and a vehicle, I think, were the supplies. Yeah. Um, if you gather all of them, game's over, you win. Yeah. Um, if somebody pulls the bitten card out of your hand during one of the accusation things, the person who had the bitten card loses because they were bitten. Yeah, and then everybody else wins, basically. It's it's always random. Like, nobody gets dealt the bitten card on purpose. It's just part of the deck you hand it out. Although I but, was dealt it twice. Yeah, but there's also this um, a scenario where at the beginning of the game, you're supposed to take one card randomly from the deck, put it back in the box, and leave it off to the side. So there's a scenario where if the bitten card happens to be the card that's randomly pulled out of the deck, nobody ever gets bitten, and you're all just pan- paranoid and panicking for no <laughs> yeah. reason. Which this is great. That's neat. Like, uh, our first game, uh, the bitten card wasn't dealt to anybody. It was the very last card in the deck that I drew, and then may- not e- like we had like a minute left when we were shuffling, and I was like, oh, shoot, oh, shoot. And I win because I was bitten, and no one found me out after a minute. Yeah. It was, yeah. It's really cool. It's a very quick game to play. It's yeah. very easy. Yeah, I think we played out. like five or six rounds of it just because... We were just trying to kill time for a quarter yeah. or five. Yeah, quarter we, we were literally waiting until that one dice company did their raffle at the end of the day. Yeah. 
And then you were heading home and the rest of us were heading out to get dinner. Yeah. Which, man, you missed, both of you guys missed a good dinner. I'm sure Sarah told you. Yeah, she did. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you would have actually been fine eating there. Have you ever been to Yakitori Boy? No, I don't think so. So it's all basically small plates. Mm-hmm. They also have karaoke upstairs. Yeah. But it's all like skewers and small plates and stuff like that. Yeah. So, like, I ate a whole bunch of pork belly. Mm-hmm. Like, they would just... You, you order them by the piece, and they would just bring out a skewer with pork belly or um, chicken hearts or yeah, just all sorts of meat and a handful of vegetables. Mm-hmm. And then they had, like, soups and tempura stuff that you wouldn't be able to eat and sushi. Yeah. I mean, it's dependent on the marinade that they use for the meats and stuff. Most like of them that. weren't in a, any sort of marinade. They were just grilled. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, like, at one point, we like, Erica and I both got onigiri. Like rice balls, mm-hmm. um, they were fried rice balls though. Yeah, um, and we didn't realize that they didn't fill them with anything, so they were literally just balls of rice. Okay, but um, they were crunchy and hot because they were actually fried. Yeah, and dipping them in a little bit of soy sauce was delicious. Yeah, so, but yeah, it was a good dinner. Nice. Apparently, the Brussels sprouts were really good too. Yeah, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah yeah. really enjoyed them. Mm-hmm. Um. But anyway, you guys uh, went to a couple of panels? Yes. Um, Drew, you actually went to both panels and probably understood the first one more than I did. Yeah. So uh, if you want to talk about those a little. So we, uh, <laughs> the whole group of us went to a panel uh, called To Prep or Not to Prep, which was a bunch of different uh, internet DMs for stuff, including our friend James and Chicasso. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, talking about their history with like over prepping for <laughs> D&D campaigns mm-hmm. and sessions and how they've kind of weaned back on crazy over prepping and their processes when it comes to just prepping for their their session yeah. and it was uh interesting discussion and a, a funny panel nice and uh it was cool to watch and at the end of the panel Sarah turns to me and goes I might want to DM. Oh, boy. And I'm like, yeah, all right. I'd rather play than DM. And yeah. Richie it, would rather play. And, it, so. and it was an interesting panel because everyone had, like, a bunch of interesting, funny, like, stories and anecdotes about how how their games had gone, uh, times and, that they over-prepped, times that they under-prepped. Like, yeah. The, and, the, the moderator was mm-hmm. throwing out, like, questions about, like, w- like, what is the time that you, like, barely prepped for at all and stuff yeah. like that. And everyone was from, like, diverse backgrounds. Like, you know, uh, James does a lot of writing campaigns that, like, no one else on that panel really does. And probably did a lot more, like, homebrew session stuff. Well, actually, the one guy also seemed to basically only do homebrew. Yeah. Never runs anyone else's stuff. Because he works with, like, uh, he works with children who don't... Uh, always have the best social skills yeah. at a uh, place out in Seattle. There was a woman from D&D Beyond. There uh, was one woman who's like uh, big in the LARP scene and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So they all had their own unique things that they come to it from. And like the one woman handles her home session way different than she handles her online session that she DMs because her home session, she makes a fuck ton of landscape stuff. Yeah. So she puts so much prep into building the world for her homebrew run at her house with her friends session because she wants to build all these cool landscape things for her players. Yeah. And it was cool. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, like, had you actually been able to go on Friday, you probably would have actually enjoyed it. Yeah. Nice. Uh, and then uh, Sarah and I went to the... It was advertised as a up, up, down, down uh, live panel, but it really wound up just being uh, Xavier Woods, uh, WWE wrestler who hosts, runs the up, up, down, down YouTube gaming channel. Just really did a Q&A. Nice. Like, I don't know if he had plans for something else and things fell through or didn't have the time to put things together after he tore his Achilles and wound up having to do a bunch of rehab stuff yeah. over the last couple months. But uh, he told a bunch of fun stories, uh, cut a promo on Kenny Omega because Kenny Omega apparently cut a promo on Twitter about some uh, Capcom mobile card game called 
Teppin <laughs> that they both play, and like Xavier Woods gave was giving them shit and told everyone to take out their phones, record this, and tweet it at Kenny Omega. <laughs> so, oh boy. And, like that panel room was packed, and mm. basically every single person took out their phone <laughs> and tweeted it. Um, told lots of funny stories, like you know he was getting asked questions about like what's his final fantasy 7 party which was cloud barrett and tifa he settled on he very definitively cloud barrett and then took him a little while to decide on the last one mm-hmm. to like who came up with the idea to throw out pancakes during their entrance for with the new day mm-hmm. and revealed the fact that one guy in the group does not wear anything under his tights. Oh, boy. And he puts pancakes in his tights and throws them out into the crowd, and people have eaten them. Oh, no. He told one story. Didn't you specifically say, though, that they've also come out and said, don't eat the pancakes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They At least the ones that he throws, that that big E throws out into the crowd. Because the rest, him and Kofi are throwing from a tray that Kofi is carrying down to the ring. So they're tell- he's telling one story. They're at a live show, or I forget if it was a TV taping or not. They're doing their entrance. Guy and a girl are at ringside. The, the woman's, like, paying attention. Guy's apparently on, like, deep into his phone doing whatever. Biggie takes a pancake out of, t- out of his tights and throws it, and this woman catches it. And Woods and Kofi start turning and to her and just shaking their heads and going, don't eat it. Do, just do not eat that one. She gives it to the boyfriend who had no idea where it came oh, from. No. They look at her and then look at him and are shaking their heads. Don't eat it. <laughs> the guy still eats it anyway. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, no. But that's, and, you know, he... Mm, Told lots of fun stories, lots of good questions from people in the crowd. T- he- talked about his favorite animes, which I forget what his list was. But Man. Well, you should have come to the panel. Uh, I wouldn't have been interested. I don't uh, know. It was funny. It was just... Yeah, honestly, I, I don't know anything about his wrestling, but he seems like a very entertaining guy from like the gaming stuff I've seen him on. Mm-hmm. Like He's been on like Giant Bomb and Kind of Funny. and Okay. Yeah, like, yeah he's... He- he he goes to conventions just to go to conventions. Like he doesn't go as like the wrestling guest. Okay. Like, he goes to Dragon Con to cosplay every year. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Nice. He he. This uh. So they had a cereal at one point called Bootios because that was kind of their thing was calling everybody booty. They're the guys that came out dressed as Saiyans. Yeah. Something. Too, yeah, they right? came out of a giant box of Bootios dressed as Saiyans. Like, in the Saiyan armor. Nice. So, he told the story of the three of them deciding on the name Bootios. He ditched them from whatever taping. He had to go to either E3 or whatever, some gaming convention or fighting game tournament. He couldn't remember exactly what it was. And then he comes back onto the road, like, the the day after, and... Kofi and Big E are like, we know what the cereal should be called. And he's like, I know what the cereal should be called. And they all just say bootios at each other. And it's like, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Nice. He was actually on the, um, the main stage D and D thing that they did that uh, night yeah. too. Mm-hmm. Um, I happened, like I was having, I was scrolling through Twitch and like one of like the featured things was like one of the PAX channels. I'm like, what the fuck is PAX doing at 10 o'clock at night? And I opened it up. I'm like, oh. It's like the guys from Penny Arcade yeah. playing D and D with other people, and mm-hmm. I saw I saw Xavier Woods on there. I'm just like, oh, hmm. that's the only person I recognize. <laughs> nice. That's disappointing. That <laughs> the only person I recognize is a fucking wrestler. Yeah. Like I said, he he actually seems cool just with like the gaming stuff he does. Yeah. Um, that's probably PAX. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. They announced the dates for next year's unplug. Yeah, it's actually before Thanksgiving yeah. next year. How weird! It's the weekend. Pre-Thanksgiving. The 20th to the 22nd next year. Weird. Yeah. Of November. But also, like, not the worst thing. No. No. So, maybe it'll be slightly warmer. I mean, granted, it was actually a really nice weekend. It was nice this weekend. We got lucky because Friday, Saturday, Sunday, chilly, but not bad. Like, like average, like, Mm -hmm. this time of year. And then um, Monday and Tuesday, just miserable rain all day. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and then today, it's supposed to be freezing cold for the rest of the I guess forever. Yeah. I don't really know. Yeah, no, the world's ending. Yeah. New Ice Age, all yep. that fun stuff. You know what? I would welcome a new Ice Age, because it would only be like 35 degrees. Look, they've already made like 20 of those <laughs> fucking movies I don't want anymore. True. <laughs> um, 
So let's run run through some some video game related stuff real quick. Um, not going to take too long with any of these, but there, there, there's apparently a new Bioshock game in development from Cloud Chamber, mm-hmm. which nice. is which is a newer internal studio at 2K. Mm-hmm. Um, but according to Kotaku, the cur- this iteration of the game has apparently been in some form of development since like 2017, and that the franchise as a whole has had at least something in development basically since Infinite came out. Not surprising. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just kind of funny that, like, for as as popular as Bioshock is, they haven't tried to force something out the door quicker. I, I, that's I, f- I feel like they did that with Bioshock um, 2. Was it Bioshock 2? Was that's, it called 2? Yeah. Okay. So there's Bioshock, Bioshock 2, and then Bioshock Infinite. Yeah, because Bioshock 2 wasn't canon. So it's not that, as the big daddy. It's not that it's not canon. It wasn't. I don't think it was made by Irrational at all. I know I Ken Levine so. wasn't involved in it. Yeah, but like I feel like when they released Bioshock Two and it didn't get like it was still a good game, but it wasn't like the raving reviews yeah, so that they got from Bioshock. Nobody cared for Bioshock Two, but everybody loved Minerva's Den, which was the story DLC that came from Bioshock Two. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, I don't think I ever played Minerva's Den. No, I, I, didn't, I never really played most of Bioshock 2 because I just wasn't feeling it. But uh, well, Bioshock Infinite, fucking beautiful. Yeah, I, I like, enjoy the, the Bioshock oh and Bioshock God. Infinite. I, I both, both yeah. of those games were great. So like, I'm not surprised that like they take their time with these ones because they know what people they want people or they know people want like these more ridiculous games and not something that's just form fitted for the the realm. Yeah. Also, I mean, 2K owns Rockstar, and Rockstar basically makes all of their money, I think. Yeah. So. Uh, also, like, this more seems like it's kind of been in development hell than it being a concerted effort to put a lot of time into developing this game. Yeah. Like, so, I and- think this is the third different studio supposedly working on Bioshock 4. Yeah, no, I think like, I think that is correct, and like this studio has nothing to do with Irrational or Ken Levine. He is still over working on whatever thing he's doing. Yeah. Um, the studio head though, uh, Kelly Gilmore, um, said that the game is still in very early stages, and it's going to most likely be in development for several years. So just because they've announced that a Bioshock game is being worked on, uh, we should not probably expect one until. At least a couple years into the next uh, console cycle, so yeah, you know that is what it is. I always like those Bioshock games, though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also some new games coming to the Nintendo Online service, which is nice because I I remember them saying after they release SNES they were gonna slow down, slow down, and I mean they kind of have. Yeah. But... So it's two games for the NES. <clears throat> yeah. Well, um, Journey to Silius. And Crystallis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then SNES is getting Super Punch Out, Kirby Superstar, Breath of Fire 2, and Star Fox 2. Which, yeah. Star Fox 2 was only ever released two two years ago, 2017, yeah. with the SNES Mini. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, like, those are all awesome games. Like, uh, I mean, Star Fox 2 was not awesome, but... But you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. they're all, like, Breath of Fire great games i've actually never played played a breath of fire game they're great but i might now yeah and um like kirby punch out like awesome awesome selections so it's not it's not upsetting like uh like the uh the playstation plus uh uh monster energy drink motocross how's that game going for you drew i I haven't played it yet what a slacker um i mean speaking of sony related stuff though MLB The Show is going multi-platform next year. Uh, 2021 at the earliest. Oh, is it 2021? I thought I saw that it was 2020. No, the I looked at the press releases today because I was talking with a friend at work about it. And yeah, it's as soon as 2021. Okay. So but might not even be in 2021, but could be. Yeah, it's still going to be Sony developed and published. But I, it, what has likely happened is the MLB was not going to necessarily re-up that contract with them for exclusivity. Yeah. Unless they agreed to publish widely. I don't even know that they actually have an exclusive license. They do. Uh, do they? They were. Ta- I've heard multiple places talk about it. Because there are, uh, are other MLB games. But aren't they arcade games, not simulation games? Like, RBI Baseball is not... 
sure, but I don't know that that was a license thing versus a the show was so dominant, why would anyone else try? I'm pretty sure that they have had a an exclusive license for at least the last fair number of years. So They were talking about it on Giant Bomb, for one. Right, but I don't think they ever talked about what the... MLB 2K had been making an MLB game up until 2014. They had actually had the exclusive multi-platform license. Sony had just basically been grandfathered in because they were making the game only for their platforms and had a deal with the MLB going back to 1998. So, like, I, I don't know that, like... 2K couldn't have come in and made a baseball game if they wanted to. So, I mean, the, uh, most of the articles I'm just seeing are from 2014, but they're alluding to Sony having exclusive rights after 2014. Okay. I'm not reading any of these, so, I mean, obviously headlines can be I mean, misleading. I just don't know that it, it just became a de facto uh, exclusive since no one else was making one. Maybe, but they also may have been paying... The, like, maybe 2K stopped making it because Sony paid money. Well, 2K stopped making it because their game sucked. That's... Like, they had greatly decreased in quality and were getting blown out in sales on multiple platforms. Because EA by... has the NFL exclusive, right? Yes. But they I mean... might also have exclusive on NHL, but I also think that was just another case of 2K saying, our game's not as good and doesn't sell as well. But cause, so uh, fuck making it. Because wasn't 2K, NFL 2K, and NBA 2K like actually generally better than the EA games? I, I thought I, NFL for, 2K sucked personally. Wasn't there like a long stretch where it was the better a, though? A lot of people say NFL 2K5 is better. I don't that was better than Madden. I don't think that was the case. It was twenty dollars instead of sixty. Oh, that was a pure marketing strategy. Yeah, but. After that, EA bought the exclusive license. But, I mean, e either way, wh whether Sony has the exclusive rights to MLB or not, they are the only ones that make a that style. MLB mm -hmm. game, and they are going to publish it on multiple platforms. So it is going to be available most likely on Xbox, probably not Switch. No. Although Nintendo, like, retweeted Sony's announcement yeah. about it, but... I mean, maybe... But, Especially two years down the road when they're making that for the PS5, I don't yeah. see that running on the Switch. Neither do I. But, you know, like, we live in a weird place now where, you know, these, com these companies known for exclusivity are kind of... Well, if it's available on, like, Xbox Game Pass or whatever, or not Game Pass, but whatever the Xbox streaming game service was, it might be because there were rumors that it was going to be on Switch as well, might be able to do that. Not all, it's not playing on the Switch. It's playing on a server that you're going through the Switch to play it as. Like oh, like the X like Cloud? a Stadia, or yeah, an the X Cloud, Cloud stuff. Yeah. yeah, I could see that being a possibility. I don't know. The the, the further we kind of get from those rumors, it makes me wonder if they were just that though rumors. Yeah, but, but yeah, I mean, you never know. Yeah. Um, there was there was also a uh, a state of play this week. Yeah, I saw that. I didn't get a chance to watch it, though. So there were only a few things that seemed noteworthy. Um, Untitled Goose Game is coming to PS4 on the 17th. And I believe the same day it's also coming to Xbox Game Pass. Mm -hmm. um, there is going to be Kingdom Hearts 3 DLC. Interesting. This January. I still want to get Kingdom Hearts 3, though. Like, But look, it took them 25 years to make Kingdom Hearts 3. But they put out DLC in August. A year, but I mean, it took them a year to put out DLC for a yeah. game that took them forever to make. So it took them forever to release a DLC. Yeah. So it's almost to the day too. Kingdom Hearts three released January twenty fifth last year. Mm -hmm. Um, this DLC, which is called Re Colon Mind, is coming out on the twenty third. Yeah. Um, but it also appears to have actual Final Fantasy <laughs> characters in it again. It's not just like Squall and Cloud. Well, I mean, I think it is those characters, but. The last few Kingdom Hearts games, like, Kingdom Hearts 3 had zero Final Fantasy. Really? Yeah. Oh. Um, but in the trailer, you definitely definitely see Eris and um. It's Aerith. Aerith. No, it's Eris. Okay. I don't care. I'm not saying it with a th. In, in, in Kingdom Hearts, it's Aerith. I don't care. That's not what I'm saying. But you definitely see at least a few of them. Yeah. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. Um, And then probably what is the biggest thing that they showed, Resident Evil 3 remake, is real. I'm excited for that. 
It's also coming out very quickly, considering Resident Evil 2 Remake just came out this past year. I'm sure it's something they've been working on. Oh, 100%, but I'm just surprised they're not spacing it out a little bit more. Yeah. So Resident Evil 2 came out in January 2019. Resident Evil 3 is coming out April 3rd. And, like, I don't know. The first half of 2020 is already pretty fucking stacked with games. Yeah. I feel like they... Unless Capcom just has nothing else going on, which is probably true. It's I Capcom. Mean, wh- what? Yeah. What does Capcom have? I don't Monster know. Monster Hunter? Yeah, Monster Hunter, Street Fighter, Fighter Pass DLC or something like that. Microtransactions. Sure, that's I'm, it. They still make money off of Street Fighter. We both know it. I don't know. They do. Pe- people people buy those, those cosmetics. I mean, it, they probably saw how well the Resident Evil 2 remake did and were like, well, we're almost done this. There's no point in holding back. I mean, or yes. they rushed it, and it's going to be trash. No, I mean, it, honestly, like they, they've actually been do- doing pretty well with um, Resident Evil lately, and yeah. the trailer looks really good. But it's more just with all of the games coming out in that general area, it seems like it would make more sense to do it just a little bit, like not much later, but maybe like two or three months, like drop it in the middle of the summer when there usually aren't a lot of big releases. Yeah, because two remake came out in January, kind of on its own. Like, it was close to some other big releases, but not smack dab in just the clusterfuck that is going to be late Q1, early Q2 2020. Yeah. Um. So, like, hopefully this doesn't just kind of get lost in the shovel. Um. But it's also going to come with that Resident Evil Resistance thing that was being teased, which is, like, the multiplayer Resident Evil stuff. Mm-hmm. That's going to just be part of Resident Evil 3 Remake. Oh, nice. Yeah, so that's kind of cool. Um. And then the last thing that was really kind of worth noting... Um, they showed a little bit of Ghost of Tsushima, but they also confirmed that they're going to be more information on Thursday at the Game Awards. So maybe we get a release date. Yeah. Finally. Hopefully. Because like, I feel like it has to come out in the first half of next year. Probably. Because otherwise it's a PS5 game. Yeah. yeah. Like that's th- Those are kind of the options at that point. Um, there was also a little Nindies thing yesterday. Um, I, only, I, I literally only noted two particular things about it, um, which... Richie wants you to watch this thing, which I did look, and it has been known for a while. I have yeah, been... Dogscape Bird's yeah. been, like, around for two years. Okay, I haven't... This is the first I've heard of it, and this is the, quote, launch trailer. Um, this game looks amazing, called Skate Bird. Yep. Uh, the, the best... Um, ex- I, I sent it to a friend, and the best response I've gotten so far was from her was, this combines my love of smooth jazz, everything bird, and Tony Hawk Underground. All in one. I think you need to unfriend this person for saying Tony Hawk Underground, as opposed to any of the first four Tony Hawks. She probably never played any of the other Tony Hawks. That's what I'm saying. Unfriend. No, I mean, not her fault she didn't play any of the others. Yes, it is. Not really. Is probably she not. older than 22? I mean, she's my age. So, yeah, this is her fault, and she needs to be disciplined for it. She, she might not have had games, but Skatebird looks awesome. It does. It, it's going to be the perfect game. I mean, it's, it's Tony Hawk with birds. Yeah, it's going to be 2020's perfect game. I doubt that, but you keep hoping. Um, they also um, revealed Axiom Verge 2 is happening next year, which was one of those just... It's a Metroidvania um, made entirely by a single person, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. So, like, all the all the design, the coding, the music, everything was just one guy, and he is making a sequel. So. Okay. It, it was also a very well-done Metroidvania. Yeah, I, I've never played it, and I... I... I I'm really getting into those Metroidvania type games, so I wouldn't mind giving it a shot. I if I were you, I I would find Axiom Verge. I think they released it on Switch. Uh huh. Um, it's probably twenty dollars or less. Yeah. Um, it is. It's like a spiritual. I'm not. That's not even the right thing. It it's very much influenced by Metroid Super Metroid. Okay. Um, like just looking at it, you can be like, oh yeah, no, this is very Super Metroidy. Yeah. So. All right. Yeah. Um. And then we'll, there's some other there, there's some Monster Hunter stuff that I guess we'll talk about next week. Yeah, after you have um, a chance they, to play it. Yeah. So basically, last week uh, when we recorded, they had announced that there was going to be another developer diary the Friday after we recorded, which was they considered it 4.5, and they gave us information about the new um, Siege, which is a uh, uh, Safi Jiva. Um, they updated the loot system with it and everything. This game has such stupid names. I mean, not really. Safi Jiva. I mean, its initial version was Xenojiva, and now Safi, S-A-F-I, apostrophe J-I-V-A. Oh, man. I, d- d- just, I hate the names. Um, But, yeah, they the uh, Siege launches on Friday, I believe. 
So I'm going to try to get a, a, some playthroughs of it. Um, they updated the loot system from the previous Siege of Cool Duralth and a bunch of other cool things. Uh, so I'll talk more about it next week. Just give you guys a little bit of a teaser. Uh, because we have a major thing to talk about that just finished airing yesterday. Well, yeah, kind so, of. So what? Drew is going to deep dive in um, Crisis for Infinite Earths over at the, the Arrowverse. So go ahead, Drew, take it away. So there's a crisis on infinite numbers of Earths. How many is that? Infinite. I don't get it. The, an unlimited number, oh. essentially. So it's like but more, a limit. more it's than an eight turns sideways. So it's like more than six. It's at least 52. Okay. Okay. I get it. Kind of. Continue, please. Oh, that's it. That's it. That's yeah. all you got. That's a really shitty deep dive, man. Yeah, I mean that is one of the deepest dives he could ever Look give. That these shows are off for a month. They're, they're not coming back till January. Yeah, and they're... I think in that time you could catch up on no. every Look, episode of every show. I honest, you know what? No, just watch <laughs> Crests on Infinite Earths. I think you could watch this as a standalone. You might have a little. You might be a little lost on things, but not majorly. That's lost. true. They, they are not so obtuse that you couldn't figure it. Like. You're going to be able to tell who the fucking superheroes are. Yeah, like, you can definitely watch and understand the entire event. Because I went to a co-worker, and I was like, do you watch the CW shows? And he's like, no. I'm like, watch Crisis. And he was like, he doesn't because he doesn't know where to start. There's a lot of them. I'm like, watch Crisis. If you like it, pick a character and watch. Literally, that's all. I don't know. There's only, like, 200 episodes worth of TV there. I think you could start watching Arrow and be done the most recent episodes of each show before they come back in January. It'd be rough, but I think you can do it. No? No. 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 All right. For every hour of that you watch, Richie will watch three episodes of wrestling. I've already <laughs> I've already made that deal with uh with 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 many Stranger things. With Stranger Things. Um but yeah, so the first three parts of Crisis happened this week. Yes. Um this the the final two won't happen till January, but um we are going to discuss those first three parts with spoilers. So if you haven't watched any of the crisis and you don't want to be spoiled, uh, stop listening. Pause now, watch them, and then come back and listen to what we have to say about it. And maybe email us and let us know what you thought about it, too. Yeah. Um, but so the, the first part was Sunday Night with Supergirl. Yes. Um, it opened up. It very much all those like little leaked cameos that you had seen. Um, that's basically how it opened with, hey, here's the dude who played the reporter in Batman 89, and here's a brief flash of two of the Titans from the DC Universe yeah. series, and here's Burt Ward walking his dog. Oh, Burt Ward's cameo <laughs> was so great. Yeah, I so, forget exactly what he said, but it was very in line with... So, Drew, you got Burt Ward dressed up in, like, the the, the rainbow... Like a like, sweater. It's basically Robin, but old. Okay. Uh, walking this dog, the skies start to turn red because the crisis is happening on his earth, and he just shouts out, holy crimson red skies of death. And then his earth disappears. And then his earth disappears. I jumped for joy when that happened. I was like, this is the best thing ever. This is the greatest thing. But yeah, the, that first episode definitely, like, they just went right for it. Oh, the first episode was so intense, shit hit the fan so quickly, so much happened, and then the second episode kind of slowed down a bit. Which, I mean, is good. Yeah, and then the third episode, it really picked up. Like, I wasn't all that happy with the second episode, and I'm glad it picked up in the third. See, I really liked the second episode. Um, I thought it was just a little slow. I'd, so, it was them finding everybody, and that's that's particularly why I liked it so much. Mm -hmm. um, but so, each of these episodes, because it's an episode of the particular show, the, the actors from those shows tend to play a little bit more central to the individual plot each time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the first episode was Supergirl. So it really opened up on Supergirl's Earth. And it took place majority on her Earth. Yeah, that that's true. I didn't really think about that. Um, I thought that... So the Argo scene, mm -hmm. where, like, Kara's mom brings Clark and... Because Superman and Lois have been living there since Elseworlds last year. Yeah. And they have their baby, John. And Kara's mom takes them to a space capsule... That will only fit the baby. Yeah. Which is obviously Superman's story. Um, I am 90% sure, though, the dialogue that they are saying to John is the dialogue that um, Marlo Brandon says in the beginning of the first Superman movie. 
I or at least be, in that part of Superman. I, I would not be surprised. Like, yeah. they, they threw down as many throwbacks and cameos as they could possibly think from the TV shows to the comics to the movies to every, like, uh, the, 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 the reporter who was supposed to be Gordon, I guess, or the reporter from Batman 89, you had the, the, um, the theme from Danny Elfman's Batman theme in the yeah. background of that. There's also quite a few times where it's the Superman theme plays, mm-hmm. like the old school Superman theme from the Christopher Reeve movies. Yeah. Which, unrelated to, to the crisis, somebody on Twitter had posted a gif of Christopher Reeve's Superman. I have not seen those movies in a long time, and I've only ever seen the first two. Um, it never dawned on me how physically different he portrayed Clark versus Superman. But there's a scene apparently in one of the movies that I just never picked up on where I guess he's in like Lois's apartment and he's Clark and he's like hunched over and looks like this kind of like nerdy, frail kind of yeah. guy. And then he takes off the glasses and just like straightens up and looks like a completely fucking yeah. different person. <laughs> and it's just like, wow, Christopher Reeves was a, a I mean, good Superman. Not, not that he, he wasn't a good actor because the dude was a good actor, but it's just like. He really defined both of those parts very differently. Yeah. Um, but so, so this episode, like Richie said, like it was very, everything just kind of hit the wall at once. Um, there were still some nice interactions. I liked the scenes between Oliver and Sarah. Yeah. Um, because they don't interact that much. They really only interact on these crossovers. And yeah. since the legends weren't part of Elseworlds at all, you haven't seen those two interact in two years. And it's also, we we've had... Now, six, six, seven episodes of Arrow, or eight episodes of Arrow, saying goodbye to everybody. Yeah. But you haven't had the chance to see him say goodbye to basically the person that started his journey with him. Yeah, which which they, they make reference to that a few times. Like, she has been part of his life <laughs> the entire time he's been Arrow, basically. What, even though she wasn't part of the first season. Yeah. Um. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's it's... So, like, it was nice to see them have those interactions and talk with each other and, like, him to be able to be, like, bye, basically, or, like, have their 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 chance, their, their place in the spotlight. Yeah, because well, you had the conversation, like, right before they kind of all split up to go take care of things, but then there's also the conversation she has with old Oliver in, yeah. in the alternate timeline, which that also fixes the issues with the 2040s that we've been seeing. So in I think it was the first season of Legends. Yeah. They go to twenty forty six and that's where Connor Hawk is the green arrow and the city is like completely destroyed. Yeah. Um they didn't travel to an alternate future, they traveled to an alternate timeline. It it, it could be that or, or it could also just be No, like... they, they actually said that in the episode. Okay. Like Sarah literally says to Ray, it's like, Oh, I guess we didn't go into the future, we went to a different universe. Okay. So like they 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 actually fixed that sort of like plot yeah. hole right there. Yeah. Um. And yeah, that episode, you know, they they brought all of the core people together. Mm-hmm. Um. It was Sarah and Ray, and then Oliver, Barry, Batwoman, Supergirl, her cast. Yeah. I think that's it at that point. Did and you just, say Superman? Yeah, and Superman okay. was there too. I was kind of counting him as part of like the Supergirl yeah. cast. And then they, they fight monsters for the episode, and yeah. Oliver dies at the end. Which was a shock, because we all know he was going to die, but we weren't expecting him to die the first friggin' episode. Yeah, and like, he goes out to make sure that as many people as possible get off of Kara's Earth before the wave hits it. Yeah. And, like, I mean, he actually shoots the, the mon- or, um, yeah, the, the monitor with, yeah. like, a, like, an electrocution arrow thing to stop him from teleporting porting Oliver away. Yeah. After he zapped everybody else away. Yeah, and he saved a million or something other people. It was like a billion, actually. Yeah. Like, it, it was a stupid fucking number. It was, it was like, it was an awesome moment, and it was an awesome way to see him go out. Um, it was just overall just a really great episode. Um, then we get into the, the Batwoman, which was, like we said, it was them gathering the team. And that was probably more of the, <laughs> that, that was the meteor cameos. Yeah, that we were gonna get. Um, so that was the episode where you get to you see Tom Welling's Clark Kent. Yeah, which I loved. I loved that. Yeah, I, the, did you ever watch Smallville? 
I I did. I never finished it, but I do know like he never actually was Superman. Like, yeah, so I think wasn't like the last scene was him opening his shirt, and then and there was he, a CG scene of Superman flying in the background. But yeah. he he never wore the suit, and apparently, like Tom Welling, the actor, never wanted to wear the suit. Like he was very yeah. adamant about it. Um, they did do something similar to what they did with Buffy, where there was a Smallville season eleven comic run for a while. Okay. That had him become Superman and and all that fun stuff. Yeah. Um I've never read it, but from what I've seen online, apparently that actually ends with him giving up his powers, which falls in line with what happened here. Like he I, apparently is no longer Superman. How does he give up his powers? I have no idea. Um I think in Smallville for uh, again from what I was reading, uh, Smallville did the thing where there was a billion different types of fucking kryptonite. Yeah. Um, apparently one of the types of kryptonite could actually completely remove his powers permanently. Okay. So that must be what happened. Yeah. But, um, yeah, in this episode, um, Luther is, stole the book of destiny from Elseworlds. Yeah. And is teleporting around the multiverse, killing all of the Supermen. Yeah. Which is kind of stupid because like all the Supermen are going to die anyway in the crisis. Yeah. But he's a megalomaniac. So. Yeah. Freaking. I hate. Hate Lex Luthor. Love John Cryer. As Lex oh yeah, Luthor. he's doing a fantastic he's amazing, job as the character. But uh, it makes me so mad of it. Mm, he sucks. But yeah, he, he sucks he, so much. He kills at least a handful of Supermen. Yeah. But uh, he goes to the actually like the heroes get to the the Smallville farm, and then he teleports them away with the book and gets ready to kill Clark. Throws a piece of kryptonite at him, to which Clark just catches it and looks at it like, huh? Yeah, yeah that's kryptonite, all right. And then throws it away. Yeah. And it was, it was like, it was a nice and moment. Then, then also knocks him out. Yeah, like he John, does. Like, Luther goes at him when his back is turned, and he just turns around and just, like, punches him in the face. Yeah. It it makes me, uh, quite like, we're getting a Superman and Lois series. I, I, I remember them mentioning. So they were working on, like, a pilot for one. Yeah. That would have been Tyler, Tyler Hecklin's Superman. Okay, it would have been that. It yeah. would have been the Superman we know. Because it'd be pretty cool if they... Use that Superman that didn't have powers, just living his life with Lois and their two yeah. daughters. Um, but I I also appreciate that, that li- like Lois's like little like side comics about like how buff he is. Yeah, because like Tom Wellings is considerably like bulkier than Tyler Hecklin. Yeah, which I thought was well, funny. Tyler Hecklin was even like I could do that with one arm. Like, yeah, like that like, was like he didn't realize he was out of uh, he didn't have powers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then. They went. They go and they find uh, 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 Brandon Ralph Superman, which is technically the Christopher Reeve Superman. Yeah, because Superman Returns is Superman technically Returns. a sequel. Yeah. Um. So they find him, and it's, like it, it's like it, it's a cool interaction between like Brandon Ralph and our Lois when it's like, do I know you? Whatever. Blah blah yeah. blah. My favorite part was when they're on the ship and Kara walks Kara in and goes, walks "Ray." In. It's like Ray, you. Have bulked up, and and then and like at like the, her universe, Clark is just like, no, that's no, kind that's, of your cousin, yeah, that's maybe? your cousin, kind of, and she's like, and looks over and sees our Ray, who is this nerdy, gangly, not in a gangly, but nerdy, skinny dude. No, because I don't know if you remember, but like even like when when they first introduced Ray in Arrow, like he was pretty jacked because yeah. there was a scene where he was doing the salmon ladder too yeah that felicity walks in and goes do i have a type yeah um and then uh and Kara even makes a reference to ray like you look kind of like my cousin in the first crossover oh yeah i forgot about that mm-hmm. um i i do i do appreciate that they've made all of the references like they're because this these shows deal with doppelgangers they don't hide the fact that, like, Ray and that Superman look the same. Yeah. Because that's one of those things where, like, other shows would have just been like, oh, yeah, no, they're they're two different characters. Nobody realizes they're literally the same fucking person. Yeah, no, like, they're like, oh, uh, Cisco says it in the beginning. Of this, it's like, that's a super doppelganger right there. Yeah. And when he sees um, Clark Kent and Ray next to each other. Yeah. Um, I th- and I honestly, I think Brandon Ralph does a great job on those two roles. Oh yeah, he does. He does um, an amazing job on those roles. Yeah, I, I, the one thing I will say out of those three episodes, I am a little bummed that um there hasn't been more of Tyler Hecklin as Superman because he's such a good Superman. Yeah, uh, it it would be it would be nice to see him come more into that role. 
But I mean, I also get it. Like, I think I think they're one trying to give Brandon Ralph kind of a bigger role because this will be his final crossover. Yeah, he's he's done after the season of uh, uh, Legends. Which, so you wouldn't notice this, but just to jump into episode the third episode, uh, Ryan Choi mm-hmm. is actually the second or third um, Adam. Okay, he actually takes up the Adam after Ray Palmer. Okay, so. They might be going that direction, or it could just be a character that they wanted to introduce for other reasons. Yeah, makes sense. Um, but the the other big cameo we got in that episode was Kevin fucking Conroy as Bruce Wayne. Oh man, and that was that was when he booms out with the voice first. Yeah. That was so great, and then like his voice isn't as like there when they're doing the actual scenes. Well, so I- even in Batman the Animated Series. He talks as Batman and as Bruce two different yeah. ways. Like it's it's very like specific to it. Yeah. And like you can tell it's still the same voice, but he just puts it like his voice is a little deeper and commanding when Batman versus a little lighter and just smoother as Bruce. Yeah. And that was kind of what he was doing there. Um, but obviously, this Bruce is also supposed to be like angry and jaded and stuff. So yeah. it was kind of somewhere in the middle. Because that was what was that storyline Bruce supposed to be? It was um. So I'm- he was somewhere in between, like where like the Bruce Wayne. Uh, so it was it was Earth ninety nine, which I was excited because I thought that was going to be Batman Beyond. Because mm-hmm. Batman Beyond came out in ninety nine, and and some of the other circumstances, like the Flash from the nineties, is from Earth ninety. Yeah, and the Batman Earth. Was um the Batman eighty nine Earth was Earth eighty nine yeah the Burt Ward Earth was Earth sixty six so I thought that was some sort of reference to that um, even in uh, episode three they go to Earth six 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 and meet up with Lucifer right which I loved that one because I I really like Tom Ellis I I really want to watch the Lucifer show now oh no you would, that that what he was there is basically him all the time yeah and it's fantastic because yeah at no point is he ever trying to hide that he is the devil. Mm-hmm. Like that is how he introduces himself to everybody. Yeah, some people believe him, some people don't. <laughs> um, but the fact that he got to inter- interact with Constantine, I also really appreciated. Even it was like two minutes. Yeah, but that the those two characters just need to be on screen together. Oh, they were perfect. Together. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> but the Kevin Conroy stuff, it was sort of like a take on Kingdom Come Batman in a way. Yeah. So Kingdom Come Bat, ba- I guess it was somewhere. It was some amalgamation of Kingdom Come Batman and like. Dark Knight Returns Batman. So Kingdom Come Batman wears like the exoskeleton because his body is just ravaged. Yeah. Um, Dark Knight Returns Batman is just angry and jaded and does actually have like a full out brawl with Superman. Yeah, I've seen Dark Knight Returns. Does not kill Superman in it. Yeah. But, you know. Basically proves to Superman like, I can kill you if I wanted to. Yeah, but also uses it as a way to fake his own death. Yeah. Um... But yeah, this this version of Batman has killed Superman, killed all of his villains, is in this exoskeleton because of his fight with Superman. Yeah, and yeah, tries to tries to kill Kara, but Batwoman stops him, and then mm-hmm. he also dies. Yeah, it was it was a great cameo. It was great to see him play a role that we've heard him play, but never gotten to like see him see play. him. Yeah. Um. And meanwhile, when all while all this is happening, um, Mia, Barry, and Constantine and Sarah have taken Oliver's body to try and resurrect him in a Lazarus pit that they find on another Earth. And which you see Jonah Hex pre-scar, and then she oh, cuts right. the scar into his face. Yeah, and she, Sarah actually makes the reference of, well, you're going to get this eventually anyway. Yeah. Um, but I was a little bummed when they started doing that. I'm just like, obviously they're going to bring him back somehow at some point, because there's still more Arrow to happen. Yeah. Like, they're not going to have a series finale where that character is dead. Yeah. Um, it just, it wouldn't make sense. Um, we know he's going to die by the end, but it doesn't make sense. Yeah. But they did sort of, like, put off expectations for that by, th- they flat out tell you, like, you know, he's going to be resurrected without his soul because that's what we've already seen happen. Yeah. Um, so that happens. And then they can't go get him the way they did for Sarah because... The universes are dying, so magic is dying. Yeah. Which is where the Lucifer cameo came in in episode three. Yeah, they, they find a way to get to Purgatory to, to rescue him. And like in episode three, we'll jump ahead, and then I think there was something else I wanted to say about episode two. But uh, they get to Purgatory, which happens to be Lian Yu, 
or at least well, in, that's Oliver's purgatory. In o- Oliver's mind, it's Lian Yu, or in his uh, soul. And it they as they're about to rescue him and they bring him to his senses, somebody shows up. So that it's the Spectre. It's Jim Corrigan. Okay. So that's what he he introduces himself as Jim Corrigan, and that's when um Constantine goes, "You don't, you're not the Corrigan I know." Okay. Um, because the Spectre and the Spectre is also a supernatural character, so he fits in the Constantine world. Yeah. Um, the Spectre. I was telling you earlier, kind of like the the DC version of Ghost Rider, or okay. Ghost Rider, I guess would more be the the Marvel version of the Spectre. Yeah. The Spectre's been around since like the 40s. Um, he is also more powerful than Ghost Rider. He is actually a like an all powerful like being of vengeance or something like that. Yeah. Um, that inhabited this cop that was wrongfully murdered. Okay. Um, and then he also murders things in like retribution for the something. I forget. The Spectre's a weird fucking it, character, it, but it, cool. It seems interesting that they're bringing that in, and it raises a question that I'm wondering. Like, do you think maybe they'll keep Stephen Amell on as the Spectre? No. Like, do you think, like, I know he's no longer the Green Arrow, but do you think maybe either in future crossovers or whatever, they'll bring him back as the Spectre? So, I'm sure that if he wants to be a part of something, they'll find a way to make him part of something. Um, but if you remember the end of last season, um, wherever he's at, Felicity goes to be with him. Yeah. Remember, like, the monitor takes her yeah, to yeah. him? Yeah. So I don't think it's a matter of, like, he is just floating around as another superhero. Like, he is going to be out of this universe for anything common. Mm -hmm. That's why I said, like, if Stephen Amell wants to, like, appear, I'm sure they will write a way that he appears. Yeah, if they Whether it's a flashback, an alternate Oliver, or as the Spectre. If they ever do a new 52 or something like that. Um, But he, he appears to definitely be the Spectre now. Yeah. And chose to not leave Purgatory with the rest of them. Which is... Like I'm very interested to see how they continue this story and yeah wrap I, up. I, I because I'm they, also, they wrap up Crisis with an Arrow episode. Yeah, um, I am also glad that John was the one that brought him out of like his blood rage, basically. Well, yeah, so like when they go to get his soul, he has no memories of himself. Yeah, they have to remind him. Yeah, and I just appreciate that. Like it was it was John that reminded him, and because I kind of expected it to be Mia. Um, before before Diggle showed up in the episode. Yeah. And, like, I get it. It's his daughter, but he literally has no relationship with her. Yeah. He's known her for, like, two days. Yeah, he's got a relationship with Diggle. It makes sense. Yeah. And that's why it was just one of those, like, this makes sense. Like, he has eight years of friendship and trust with this guy. Yeah. And, like, literally, like, the I think the first things that John says when he finds him is, I'm sorry I wasn't there with you. Yeah. Um, and a couple other cameos. These were for, or not cameos, but, like, little throwaway things that I really liked especially in episode two and three, uh, they apparently Sarah has promised that the, uh, legends no longer have to do crossovers. She, like, yeah. and, and I, I find the jokes funny that like, I the don't, way they, I, I thought it was funny last year. I don't like them this year. The two, the two times they did them this year, I thought they were like good throwaway funny lines. Cause they were like, well, we need the wave rider or whatever. And Sarah's like, well, I promised my team they don't have to do crossovers. So they just go to a different earth to get, the 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 ship an abandoned wave rider yeah which uh um rory was on there like an alternate rory yeah, an alternate dimension rory who's walking around with the heat gun and ice gun because i guess somehow snart died and they uploaded his consciousness into gideon and then snart is voicing the the computer so the so at one point um when lila as harbringer goes to that wave rider to get it and finds rory um, she says all, I thought all the legends retired. He yeah. goes and one died. Okay. So I'm assuming that was snart that he's talking. Yeah. About. Um, so I, I like, I liked that. I liked that they had Rory in it because he is, although it's not our Rory, it's still, he's a great character. Yeah. And he, he's basically in it for comic relief. He's done, yeah. he's done nothing but kind of be funny. Yeah. Um, but I feel like since the, fi- is the final episode Arrow or is the final episode Legends? I believe the final episode is Arrow. But Legends is still one of the episodes, so I'm, yeah. I'm assuming that the big climactic battle is just going to be everybody. Oh, it's definitely going to be everybody. And I think they've actually even shown pictures where it's everybody. Yeah, there might even be characters that aren't really existent right now, like Stargirl and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's possible. Um, and then in episode three, they had they again did the uh, crossover throwaway line. Um, 
they vibe on, or they teleport onto the ship, and uh, Elongated Man is just excited. He's like, oh my god, and he's excited to see everybody. And uh, Frost is just like, calm down, guys, it's his first crossover. I was like, you know what, I didn't realize that. He wasn't in the crossover last year. Yeah. I don't know. I wish it. I wish they went with team up instead of crossover. Yeah, I, crossover still works. I mean, it does, but at the same time, it's like you're you're being a little too on the nose that this is a TV sh- thing. Whereas, like, if you just keep calling it team up, people get the idea, but you're at least keeping it a little more like not breaking the fourth wall as much. Yeah, yeah. But in like a series that doesn't really break the fourth wall, yeah. otherwise, it's um, just it, it. It's a little funny thing. It's like oh, crossover. They also, I forgot, they they brought Black Lightning into it. Yeah, they brought Black Lightning into episode three. And they killed the 90s Flash. Yeah. Which, I never watched that series, but I thought it was sweet that, like, when he died, or when he was sacrificing himself, they literally show a clip from the 90s Flash series. Yeah, which was, I like, that was, that was very, like, it was a heart, heart touching moment. Yeah, because he literally, he, he takes Barry's speed force so that he has enough power to reverse the thing yeah um but overall like the the whole it, it ends because we're basically at that point we we've, we've really talked through most of the third um it ends with uh the anti-monitor winning yeah like basically all, all existence is wiped out yeah and um the seven paragons which are the seven people they were trying to pull together which just so happened to be batwoman kara barry john jones uh, um, Brendan Routh, Superman, and Ryan Choi. Ryan Choi, and there's one more because there's seven. Batwoman. I uh, did. I say. I thought I said Batwoman. Batwoman, Kara, Barry, John Jones, Ryan Choi, uh, Brandon Routh, Superman, and then they're they're oh, uh, Laura Lance or not Laurel, uh, Sarah, Sarah Lance. So it just happens to be all the main characters basically. Yeah. Uh, they they're teleported by uh Pariah, who is um. That th- this the season's new, this wells. season's wells. He became pariah after he opened the door. Um, teleported to the negative. I can't remember the name of the zone. The antimatter. Oh, or, you, no! They teleports him to that thing like that, that's outside of space and time. Yeah, it was from Legends season one. One. Yeah, it's where Snart sacrificed himself. Yeah, and uh, teleports him there, where then something happens to Brandon Ralph Superman, and he turns into Lex Luthor because fucking Lex Luthor changed the page. And got rid of Superman and put Lex fucking Luther in it instead. Yep. But I feel like that was all part of the Monitor's plan. Because he, he said Luther had a role to play. He, but he already said Luther played his role. I feel like... So, in the comic, from what I know of it, um, the Monitor's plan was very, like... It's, it was very detailed. So, I feel like even that was something that he had planned. And I... I so... I, I feel like that was part of the plan. Luther is going to be the way that they figure out how to get off of there. But I hope that they're stuck there for the month. Like I hope, yeah. I hope the next episode Which, picks up and it's not right after. I hope that they've been stuck at the end of time for thirty days. And they usually do that. They usually do that when it's a mid-season break because something big happens and you know they're injured or whatever. Mm-hmm. This is a little different. Like though, the entire multiverse just ended yeah. and they're stuck at the end of time. Yeah. So it, it it's going to be very interesting. It sucks. We have to wait a month, but I'm not too mad about it. No, there was also I don't know if you caught the line um, when the flat when Team Flash first gets there, um, and they find out that Earth Two had been destroyed first. Yeah. Um, I think it was Caitlin is the one that realizes that like Harry and Jesse Harry were gone. Jesse. Yeah, like they're like, oh no, Harry and Je-. like they literally say like, yeah, oh no, they're gone. Oh no, like um, I I wanted I want to get the comics the, the car- crossover comics. I think there were two of them. You we won't, about. though. We both know to. that. I want to, because I want to... We're, we're more likely to get Drew to watch anime than you to buy a fucking no, comic book. I mean, not necessarily. I gotta know when they get released, these two comics. I gotta look it up. But I might be well, I might go get them just to read them, because I want to know... They are probably already out. Maybe. I, I'm assuming they probably released them after this, but they're releasing them before then it comes back. Who knows, though? Maybe. I have to double check. I'm um, sure the internet does know. But yeah, that that is probably it. Yeah, I think so. Right? Yep. You sure? No. So what did you think of Crisis? I I, I have not and prob- almost certainly will never see it. It's so good, though. God, stop hating fun. Just stop. It's just like D&D. They, they all have a class. I mean, yeah, kind of. 
I don't know. I'm kind of in the Jeff Gersman camp of fuck non-interactive media. Eh. Like, if uh, there's something on my screen, I want to be intera- interacting with it. So to- I don't, I don't, that's what Twitter's for. I just for. don't want to be passive. That's what Twitter's for. No. You yeah, wa- Twitter's for, Twitter is my non-interactive media. No, you watch something and then you get on Twitter and you bitch about it. Like every other person in the world. But yeah, I think that's probably going to be it. Be it for this week. Um, next week's, next week's a regular week and then Christmas. Yeah, so we'll, uh. Last, or uh, the Rise of Skywalker is next week. Yes, it is. So. Uh, I'll be seeing it the Saturday after we record. I see it on Thursday. Nice. So the week of Christmas, <laughs> whenever we figure out our recording schedule, we will probably talk about the Rise of Skywalker. Are you planning on seeing it? Probably. I don't know if we'll see it that first week. But, no, I was just curious if you were planning on actually like going out to see it or not. Sarah will want to see it more than I do. Because you hate fun. Yo, those last two <laughs> movies suck. They didn't, though. They do. No. They're fucking I, bad. I don't love The Last Jedi, but I liked, I, I actually legitimately liked Force Awakens. So I liked The Last Jedi more. I, it was, I hated that fucking casino stuff in Last Jedi. Yeah, that was bad. And like Force that, Awakens was, that was a New Hope HD remix. And you know what? That's fine. A New Hope's a good movie. I just watched it today. Um, but yeah, if you want to find more of our content, you can, you can head over to www.one-quest.com. You can also help us out by supporting us at patreon.com slash one quest. If you can't help us there, though, you can help us by going to your favorite podcast platform like uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, etc. Review us, subscribe to us, rate us, all that fun stuff. All of that stuff helps and matters. Uh, we also have social media, facebook.com slash one quest online or at one underscore quest on Twitter and Instagram. There's a whole bunch of pictures from PAX on the Instagram if you want to look at those. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash onequestonline, and you can send us emails to social at one-quest.com. And yeah, we'll be back next week with something else to talk about. Until then, thanks for listening. Bye. See you. Bye.